Looks like we are now live. All right, so welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More with your host, John Henry Sheridan. And today I got an exciting guest, my good friend, uh, Mike Amari. So How welcome, you doing? Mike. Pleasure to be here, John. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is great. Uh, so Mike is a teacher. He is um, a writer. He is an archer, an arching teacher, right? Archery uh, teacher. Uh, yeah, no, I, I currently hold a level two certification to uh, train for both archers and coaches. So, so I can also train coaches to become archery instructors as well. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. As well as you're an avid fan of all things uh, Star Wars, I believe. Is that right? Oh, uh, yeah. I've been a very, very large Star Wars fan uh, just about most of my life. Uh, I'm a big fan of a lot of things. As well. <laughs> I'm, I'm a giant nerd is what people tend to call me. And that's fine. Like that is a badge I wear with honor. Um, like that's why I use the green screen to hide the shame of the stuff that's actually behind here. Um, okay. the, the toys and the comics and all that stuff. Okay. I thought you were actually in a library, Mike. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, that's what I meant. This is my very sophisticated library that I have built in my manner. That's, that's yes, I would, I would love to have a, a nook like this. You kidding me? This would be beautiful. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so, uh, so maybe uh, a fun thing, I haven't, uh, I think someone recommended I do it. Maybe Tom Scuderi recommended it or somebody said, why, why not ask your guests to explain the first time you met me, if you could remember that, which I can't remember the first day or anything like that, but if you can remember how we met. I don't remember the first day. Um, I, I remember what I have as my memory of meeting you for the first time. It's the thing that galvanizes up, like this might've been the first time we had a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. We were both in the band program at Madison High School. I had known you by like reputation around the school. Uh, I had heard of you because I was brand new to the band program. I'd also never taken any sort of formal musical education despite music being very important to my family um i had never learned how to read music play an instrument anything like that uh, i had just consumed music and never was part of a band program so when i was put into the band program freshman year i got to meet a lot of people who were already invested in doing band and you were someone who was already well known for being quite a musician and for being very involved in the band program uh, but I think it was, I want to say my sophomore year, maybe um, the very beginning of it, we wound up somehow in the band room at the same time. You were definitely not in the same band class as me at that point. I think I was taking concert band at that time and you had already moved up to like, you know, or like I was intermediate, whatever was both like the second level up. And you were like the level up and in jazz band at that point, but somehow you were hanging out and we had like some mutual people we had gotten to know and we sat down and we started we started talking about a book I was carrying on me. It was um, the Sword of Truth series uh, by oh, Terry Goodkind. Good kind, yeah. uh, yes, and it was the very first one, Wizard's First Rule. And I'm sitting uh, there, I just started, I was reading through it, and me and you, you had either read it or started reading it also. And so we struck up a conversation that way, and then it, it just kind of grew from there. We started seeing each other passing in the hall, said hi, got to know, to know each other through the band program, and then through marching band, I think. Marching band and sing. Um, mm -hmm. which if anyone who was part of the Brooklyn high school scene ever uh, sing as the student run, you know, student run, they have you know, the faculty people who are there with you while you do it, performances right. that you do. And I remember I got to know a lot of people my sophomore year because that was the year I think you had suggested, uh, you along with Jeremy Batchelor had suggested that they need to start doing live music again uh, because they were doing the performances with recorded music. And oh, okay. it was terrible. Oh, you know what it was? It was that sophomore year, me and Jeremy had done, it was, we had done music with the band there for both of the performances. In, because normally you have like junior fresh and senior soft, they compete against each other. We did the music for both of them that year. The next year you were doing um, the band for whatever your year was. Um, but I, through all that stuff, we had wound up uh, kind of connecting and getting to know each other. And it really just from there, well, we started, you know, hanging out during school time. And I was looking to, by my junior year, looking to learn to play guitar. And mm -hmm. you were more than willing to. I, I mentioned, like, I was, I was actually, I was, I was afraid to approach you. <laughs> I was like, because I knew nothing about guitar. I felt really terrible about my musical ability. Like, even as a trumpet player for, in my second year or whatever that was, I didn't feel like I was advanced enough to approach you and be like, oh, I want to learn this other instrument 
um, I was super intimidated, but you were just super open about everything. You're like, yeah, no, it's great. Like I'm taking on students, you know, you set up a time for me to come down to your basement and start learning guitar. And like from there, that's our friendship kind of grew from that uh, very rapidly from there, mm -hmm. getting to know you as a teacher. Um, and just as a teacher, you, you were like one of the most just straightforward, like everything we're going to talk about is important. Everything we're going to talk about is going to feed somewhat into um, what you're going to take away here. It's not just about the notes on the page. Uh, it was the whole experience of having you as a teacher. And mm -hmm. we, we started, you know, I, with that, I started hanging out and playing some music with people from your neighborhood. Cause I grew up on Kings highway uh, by 22nd street. You were in like the Marine park area. And so I didn't know a lot of like your group of people. And so got to know a lot of people through you that way. Uh, I think every episode I've seen of your podcast so far, everyone has said you are a person who connects other people. Like I have met a lot of people because I knew you. And every time I meet someone, I like, we'll go through, Oh, you went to Madison. How about this? And your name will invariably come up like years later. Like I, I was, and <laughs> there are people who I currently work with who for years I'd worked with them, didn't have much of a conversation. We start talking and your name comes up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like this is incredible that no matter where I turn, mm -hmm. you kind of you kind of jump in here. By the way, I should warn That's you: fun. if you just let me go, I'm gonna ramble. So I'm gonna That's cut. Great. I'm gonna cut that there because okay. I went well past your question, and you can. So, so what me I, yeah. More. So what I'll say is, uh, I might interrupt you to get more detail about a specific point. How about that? Absolutely. Okay. So um, <laughs> just want to give a shout out to Lisa Markwood's Tro, who's who's checking it out. Who is the, who is the, who is the coworker I was talking about? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I remember like this year or last year when I did the video for you uh, for Daddy. Um, she said, "You know John?" I'm like, "Yes, I know John." <laughs> she goes, "You did the video for him?" I'm like, "Yes." And it was just one of those things like, "Oh my goodness!" Like, like who knew? You know, one of those situations. Yeah. I thought that was great. Yeah, no, that, it's great when you see like uh, the six degrees or two degrees or one degree of separation in your circle in your life. That's really always fun. Uh, yeah, and so Lisa says hi. Hi, Lisa. Doing, Lisa. Thanks for watching. Yeah, I apologize. I don't see the chat. So if anyone's saying anything toward me, I just I appreciate all of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So if you see my eyes drifting, I'll just be looking in case uh, people are chiming in live. Yeah, um, no so. It's yeah, really fascinating to hear you tell the story because, uh, you know, as I'm writing my autobiography, going telling my story, what keeps on recurring is like, man, there's so many holes in my story that only the people that I in my life could, who are part of the story, can fill in. So what I always really keep realizing is my story is the story of all these people who who my life touches. And, and who has touched my life. So that's why kind of the podcast is an outgrowth of that in some sense is that I want people to tell their story because one of my f favorite things of doing is telling my story. So I imagine other people would enjoy telling their story too, if I, since I enjoy it so much, you know, so to create a platform to that and to like, as Khan, my friend Khan said the other day, Constantine, uh, to reach, uh, to reach across rather than like reach up and like right I, it was find funny, I was just, people i was just listening to that and that i love that part of it where you guys were talking about the idea of we weren't trying to reach someone who is like a expert in their field we're going to pull them down to learn wisdom from these people or reach down to someone who is is you know not where we are and want to be where we are but reaching across the people who are like in our circle in our lives and just kind mm -hmm. of giving a voice to everyone I, I thought that was wonderful when you guys were talking about that in the last episode Oh, cool. I appreciate it. And, and then with another friend, I was uh, actually Alan, who was a guest that uh, we talked recently, and he was pointing out that, uh, yeah, um, ha having people, well, actually, I, I lost my train of thought, uh, but I'll give, use my own thought. I forget what, he, but what my point was with him, but um, yeah. Oh, so I think right now we're just so saturated with media right so yeah it's so easy to i remember i would listen to a lot of podcasts that i loved and a lot of them in recent years um and it's not i wasn't listening to superstar podcasts but still right. it is this like reaching up thing like this guy has so many subscribers or was successful with this or this woman yeah. has her own business and it's good and i'm glad these people are succeeding but 
a lot of times I would feel a little bit sick because I know where I am. And I just think that everybody's story is important. So why is it that we highlight like success stories all the time? Why not just tell the every day, every man's story and just see that them all as success in their own right, you know, just you know, redefine it. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's, uh, I've, I've been listening to podcasts probably as far back as like, Oh, seven or something like that. Um, I, I was most of it was media based, uh, a lot of video game stuff, a lot of stuff that people would kind of roll their eyes at to hear that a grown man in his 40s would still be listening to. But like I said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a grown child is basically what I am. And the idea that the platform became, you know, podcasting itself became this super open platform. Anyone with a USB microphone, and that's it, could just go ahead and upload something to iTunes or the Google Play Store or something like that. And there you go. You have just as much a chance as anyone else. Um, the problem is, like you said, as it starts to get saturated, we have a lot of the more independent voices start to get kind of pushed you know, to the side or down as a lot more attention goes to the voices that have more name recognition, more like traditional media. And that's been a shift probably in the last five years or so, I want to say more than anything, since like 2015, 2016, we saw a real big boom in that stuff. We're almost, you know, I was listening to a lot of independently done story-based podcasts, uh, people sharing their experiences, writing podcasts, video game podcasts, movie podcasts, where it was just people who are passionate about it. And all of a sudden I started seeing, oh, this person who is a professional standard comedian is doing a video game podcast. And all of a sudden the listener base starts to vacate from the more independent stuff and go to the bigger name stuff. Yeah. Um, or, you know, like we have something that's a, uh, you know, talking about history. Like there's a lot of great history podcasts out there. The minute you get someone who's, you know, more along the lines, like NPR starts putting stuff out that's more history-based, they people start shifting away from the more independent and go to the more well-known name, which is kind of how media mm. tends to go. Right, which is, which is unfortunate in a sense. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that, that reminds you what, what Alan said. And he said that, um, uh, <clears throat> Oh, no, it slipped my mind again. Uh, and and for the listeners, that I'm not blaming Joe Rogan for a lot of that, but <laughs> um, right. but he is like one of those big examples of it, where he was a person doing he just he put a microphone in front of himself, starts talking about things that are important to him, but because he's a big name, so many people shift to just listen to what he says rather than seeing the litany of voices that are out there. And again, there's nothing wrong with listening to him, but I'm someone who. I'm sure John as well. I like hearing the, like the tapestry of it, right? Like I'll listen to someone like Joe Rogan, but then I'll listen to like five other people who are of like mm -hmm. opposing viewpoints or not even opposing viewpoints sometimes just doing something different. You know? Yeah. Right. Right. So yeah, actually. So yeah, what Alan did say is that having the, the people that I have on my podcast, he noticed, he just was commenting on that are people that he can relate to. They're like real people right. that like what we're talking about is like ordinary people, whatever that means, can relate to. But when you talk about certain status uh, that are not in like everyday reality that most of us exist in, we can't relate to them. It's, we, we try. And then when we fail to relate, I'm not saying all of us, but let's say for myself, I feel bad. Like, how come I don't? Right. I haven't had those experiences, you know? Right. I feel like I suck. But then when you hear other people, just their ordinary, everyday thing, again, ordinary just meaning like the everyday man or woman who are still doing their best with, with what life is uh, putting in front of them and what they're generating on their own. Uh, I don't know. There's just, I always felt an anxiety with most podcasts, some sort of anxiety, not like, noticeable like if i was in the mood to like get something done podcast would motivate me motivate me to do it right. but very rarely did it just relax me and make me feel mm. good about being me you know so I, my goal was to just create a dialogue where like if we're hanging out if people want to join they feel like they're hanging out with us see and that's it's interesting because i remember having an experience before i was in the podcast back when most of what we listened to was just over the air radio um my dad when i was growing up was a huge howard stern fan and take it as you will you know he was very crude very rude about certain stuff um there was a certain amount of entertainment to be had from that and so i of course in my early 20s continued to listen to him as i would drive places um until one day i'm driving to work i was working at staples at the time 
hating not every minute of it. I worked with some very nice people, again, Jeremy Bachelor, um, but it was not the best job. And I was busting my butt going through college at the same time. And I'm driving to work in this broken down, like 13 year old Chevy Blazer that I was keeping running on a prayer and a dream. And on the radio, I'm listening to Howard Stern tell his funny stories. And one of his funny stories was him complaining about how when he went to an event, they didn't have a helicopter for him. And there I am stuck in traffic in my broken down car, going to my barely more than minimum wage job, listening to this man complain about billionaire problems. And I couldn't take it anymore. I'm like, no, I can't. Like you said, I can't relate to this. Like, this is not something I can't even fathom what that would feel like or why I would care about that. And so I stopped listening at that point. I never kind of went back. Mm -hmm. And I was, so a couple of years back, back in 2017 or so, I love listening to podcasts, but a lot of the podcasts I listen to about the media I enjoy are from people inside the, the medium. Like there's movie podcasts by people who make movies. There's video game podcasts by people who work in like the video game news industry. And me and a bunch of my friends who all worked part-time in an archery range at the time, I was doing a weekend gig there we realized that we had these great conversations about TV shows, movies, things like that, but no one was hearing because we were hanging out at the Archer range doing it. So we did a podcast for about two years and we did 50 episodes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the I whole, remember the podcast. I know you did 50 episodes. That's great. Yeah. We only get 50 episodes before we finally kind of life got it in the way and scheduling got in the way. And we, but the whole idea was it's just a couple of normal people having their normal people ideas about stuff that may or may not be relevant to the rest of the world. You know, we weren't necessarily looking at the brand new releases that we didn't get to see yet. You know, we were talking about stuff that might've been four or five years old. Anything that wasn't important to us that we had something to say about, we would say mm -hmm. something about it. And my whole thing and my mission statement for it when I told the other guys who were on it was this, we're gonna do it because not because we're gonna get a million viewers, we're not gonna get a million people listening to, it, we're not gonna look to make money off this, that'd be great if we did, but we're doing it because we have something we want to say about this. It's an excuse for us to hang out and have a good time. And if at any point it gets to the point where we don't feel like we need to do this anymore, we can just stop. And that's kind of what it did. It ran its course. We, we got out what we wanted to say. We enjoyed our time doing it. And instead of trying to crush ourselves under the wheel of, uh, no, we got to like make this a full-time job. We got to put content that we got to do this. We just kind of let it be. And so mm -hmm. I still have it up. It's still there. Like it's still something I can point people to. It's something I can still listen to. And it's, I have this nice little chunk of here's me for a couple of years talking about stuff that was important to me. And it's stuff like that, that I try to seek out when I listen to podcasts also. Um, mm -hmm. Because instead of hearing somebody talk about like a world that I can't even imagine, like, listen, I, I love movies. Roger Deakins and his wife has a great, they, he's, if you don't know Roger Deakins, cinematographer behind movies like Shawshank Redemption. And he is a phenomenal cinematographer. Him and his wife are a team. And they do the Team Deacons podcast. And it's great listening to it because you get to hear all this behind the scenes stuff. But almost every story ends with, and then the studio gave us a million dollars to do this shot. And then I'm like, well, okay, I, I, I can't relate to that. Like, I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm messing with cameras in my basement. I'm not getting a million dollars from a studio, you know? Yeah, th that's what I was getting at. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm going to have to acknowledge someone's post in a second, but I just want to yeah. make, um, make a point is uh, I always thought... You know, when you hear people uh, encouraging starting, you, be, you know, beginning to be a content creator or a YouTube channel, and they always, my, always is a huge, uh, it's a generalization, but almost always what I run into is like how to bring your subscribership up to a thousand, two thousand, like quick, you know, to do what, right. how to succeed quick. And I always kind of want to say how to build, you know, a very tiny YouTube channel that you love, like, Right. How to get 20 subscribers in a year. Like somehow like make it so non-stressful for people. Just say, okay, I could do that. And it doesn't matter if I get a lot. It doesn't matter. You know, like just trying is more than is is victory, you know? Like right. just it, it, it's the act of making, the act of creating something. And for mm -hmm. me, that has to come first if I'm making something. Because listen, I have my day job. I have the thing that's putting bread on my table and and I have the thing that's, you know, securing my future. If I'm taking my time off to make something, I'm going to try to make sure it's something I want to make. And if five people see it, if zero people see it, if a thousand people see it, it it's kind of all the same. Thing. Listen, I would love a hundred million people would see it. That'd be great. But at the end of the day, it's the making of the thing that is important to me. And everything else that comes from that is kind of gravy. 
And, and with the, my old podcast, it was like that. I would get people who I hadn't heard from for years. We're like, oh, we saw you post on Facebook. I heard it was great. And people were dropping some really nice comments to me privately on it. And that was enough for I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to continue to do this because people are, you know, giving me some good feedback and I'm enjoying doing it. So let's keep doing this, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And the minute it stops being that, why, why drive yourself crazy? <laughs> Absolutely. So here's a comment. Uh, Thomas Tabone. Hey, Thomas. Thanks for Thomas. watching. He says, uh, hey, Mike Amari, do you remember me? I was an old student of yours at Roy H. Mann Junior High during 2008-2009 school year. Not to sound like I'm bragging, but I remember being one of your favorite students in that poor behaved class, LOL. <laughs> I was a big um, New York Giants fan. I remember every Monday morning in your class, we used to talk about the New York Giants. Anyway, I know John through another friend. It's a small world. Hope all is well. I never forget my teachers. And and there we go with that connector again, right? John, John with you being a connection between people. Uh, Thomas, I absolutely do remember you. I remember that was that was the first class I ever taught, actually. That was one of those classes that is galvanized in my memory. Almost every single student in there it holds a special place in my head because they were the first students who helped teach me how to be a teacher. Um, mm-hmm. And to your point, Thomas, you were saying, yes, you were absolutely one of my favorite students. You were a hard worker. You were a person who was always putting 110% and always asking questions, always putting yourself out there just to ask how I was doing. Like that was always something that stood out to me too. You're always just asking how my day was going. You'd ask me about, like you said, the giants and we'd have these great conversations. Um, and that helped teach me just how open I can be with students, like how much I can build a relationship with students and not have that very traditional, like I'm the teacher, you're the student sort of like, you know, adversarial relationship. Um, sure. And I, I learned a lot from that entire class. And you said that poorly behaved class, they, Looking back, they were not as poorly behaved as maybe we would remember. And part of that was also me learning how to do what I needed to do in there and be be a leader in the classroom. And that class taught me a lot about what it meant to be a leader of young people. And that was something I, I still to this day reflect back. I'm, my goodness, 14 years into my teaching career because um, that was the 2008 school year. Um, I'm still thinking back to lessons I learned that first year. So, Thomas, I'm glad to hear that you remember me and you remember me Finally, I absolutely remember you from that class, and I hope everything's going really well for you. Yeah, cool. I'm glad you guys could connect there. Yeah. Um, and I'll add, interestingly, that that was the, uh, the the one that year that I actually did subbing at Roy H. Mann, so I actually saw you in your very first. That's right. I do, I do remember yeah. that. I remember you stopping by. You're like, wait a second. I heard your voice down the hall. <laughs> like... <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, my time period in uh, the DOE was that short-lived uh, two-year period, basically. But um, yeah, it's amazing that you keep on forging through and and with uh, bright eyes. You know, you yeah, hadn't seen you your eyes dim. You're still passionate about life. I, you know, it's I've I've been very lucky with where I am teaching, with who I've been teaching, with the students I've had. And again, I I've been approaching it with the mindset of each year I'm learning more about what it is I do. Um, it is a craft and it's something first and foremost, it's why I got into teaching um, is I wanted to make sure I was doing something that I felt kind of mattered. Um, for those who don't know me, I didn't start out teaching. Teaching was a second career for me. I, I started out the first career, I guess you can say was I was doing graphic design. Uh, I was working for a kind of a lo- lower scale company, uh, if you ever had the marketeer thrown on your doorstep and with all those ads wrapped up and you yelled at the guy who walked by with the shopping cart, I was the person who was laying out those ads for the companies and doing the circulars and stuff like that. And the window signs you'd see in the big stores for Conway and stuff like that, I would print those and design those. And at first it was great because I was learning how to do a new skill. I was, you know, it was something I knew how to do, but I was learning how to do it on a professional level. And it slowly gnawed at me though, that I was basically just making something that someone looked at for a month and a half, if that, then I got thrown in the garbage and then I had to make more of it and then it gets thrown in the garbage. And Mm -hmm. at best, the impact that I was leaving behind was somebody who owned a store could charge people slightly more for something they didn't need and probably pay his employees slightly less. Um, That was the thing that bothered me most when I would go to deliver the things to the stores. I would see how some of these stores run their business and I was helping these people continue to run their business in a way that I did not think was all that healthy. And it bothered me. It gnawed like in the middle of me as I was getting, you know, into my third year doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, I desperately wanted to not do that. And at the time I was, um, I was tutoring part-time because I had a creative writing degree. So not much you can do with a creative writing degree other than, you know, 
try to keep, you know, writing, which is something, you know, I, I do still do. Um, or, you know, tutor and teach and stuff like that. And through the tutoring, I want to, you know, get involved with the teaching fellowship and long story short, I, I wind up at uh, Roy Mann in 2008, 2009. And that's where I still am to this day. I've been very lucky to be where I am. I have super supportive administrative staff who is always, always willing to listen to ideas we have about how we can improve what we do. Um, and I've had some great students. Like I have a lot of students who still reach out to me just to let me know how things are going and to let me know that, you know, they, they appreciated something I said or something I did, you know, and that, that more than anything is why I still enjoy what I do because I see the impact it has on the people I do it with. And mm -hmm. as long as that's still the case, I will still be happy about doing this and I'll still be approaching it with as much kind of like verve as I can, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great, man. And having that childlike spirit, I'm sure, goes a long way, you know? Oh, and listen, I mean, you're around like 11, 12 year olds all day. You can't help but be an 11, 12 year old like inside here. <laughs> like it kind of, I've, I've held on to my immaturity longer than most people probably. And, <laughs> and be, being around immature, like young people, is a uh, it helps with that sometimes cool so i'm going to go to the uh formal interview part which i yeah, generally yeah. would start off uh, in the beginning but uh i've been like i said i run like, off to the races i just start talking yeah I apologize. it's great man <laughs> it, it, if if we're talking and it's just rolling you know what, what's the difference you know, mm -hmm. um as long as you know we're we're enjoying it so but i do want to ask you some questions since i am calling yeah. this an interview um can you remember what it was that got you to enjoy music in the first place? What were some of the earliest inspirations musically? Um, it's uh, So if we're talking listening to music, just music being important in your life, yeah, that starts from the womb, man. My, my family was, music was just constantly on in my house. Uh, um, my dad was very much a classic rock guy. If it was something that was played during the 60s and 70s, um, it was something he would constantly listen to he was also someone who was interested in contemporary music like he would listen to like things like metallica as they were coming out and was sort of into them like he liked some of the newer stuff um he didn't com like completely shun it as it came and my mom she was so solidarity 101.1 cbs fm when it was all doo-wop and oldies and stuff like that that is more than anything if i'm talking musical memories just in the kitchen in my house like my mom would have that radio on the kitchen. It would be 101.1 and it would be, you know, Bobby Darren and that whole, you know, time period of music. And so th those sort of earworm kind of poppy things are lodged in my brain forever and kind of like helped build what I kind of thought of as music. And then from there, the first time I remember thinking of music as like, oh, here's something I like, not just something my parents like mm -hmm. was, <laughs> this is going to sound, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Janie's Got a Gun by Aerosmith. Oh, what's wrong with that? It's a great it was, song, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've mentioned it to people before and like musicians, musicians that look at me and go, oh, really, man? I'm like, yes. It's Listen, I unabashedly love that song. And it was one of those things. It was one of the first videos I saw on like MTV or something. Mm -hmm. And so like, I'm like, man, this is like a movie. And I was, yeah. I don't know, I was like, what, like eight when that song came out. Yeah. And so that was off of Aerosmith's Pump. And so I'm like, man, I love this song. My dad seized on the moment. He's like, oh, you like that? He pulled the cassette out. He was an Aerosmith fan. And so he pulled out, he had pump, he pulled the cassette out and he handed me, he had a Walkman from the seventies, which at that point was only a 10 year old piece of equipment, but it was like that old, like steel, like could drop it in a tank and it would like still work yeah. with the orange headphones. And I would, mm -hmm. from then on, that's what you saw me with. I had the little like Walkman listening to pump. Um, I, I eventually listened to some Joe Satriani simply because like that was the next album I listened to because it was surfing with an alien. Uh, it uh, had Silver Surf on it, yeah. and I love comic books. Didn't uh. much care for the album as, an, as a nine-year-old, <laughs> but I, um, I eventually came around to really enjoy his music. And so from there, though, it, it becomes, I get way into classic rock because of my dad. Um, and then I'm, tr I'm trying to think, there's a, like a lot of shifts that happen with like my enjoyment in music. I don't know if you have other questions you want to lead toward that. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. So then, uh, so what were some of your favorite bands growing up? So that was kind of some of your early inspirations, and that, that's pretty cool. I never knew that. Yeah. Aerosmith and Joe Satriani were too. I wouldn't have guessed that. Actually, I would have guessed more like <laughs> hip hop or something. Yeah, I don't know. Like a lot of people have those kind of. Well, so it's, I, it's... My, I do. You know, hip hop was crisscross and make you jump. jump well, like so that, that was early. when I hit when I hit junior high school. My musical mm -hmm. tape shipped completely because as when you hit that age, you 
start to kind of imprint on the people around you and what's popular and you want to kind of fit in with the group that's around. And so, yeah, that whole era of hip hop, you know, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg start coming up at that time. You have Notorious B.I.G. toward the middle of junior high school years. All the stuff that I look back on now and I can appreciate some of the musical stuff that's happening in it, but not something I would probably choose to listen to on my own now was something that was way, way important to me when I was when I was in junior high school. Um, and to my parents' credit, it was one of those things where a lot of my parents' friends were like, You're not in my house. Don't listen to that nonsense in my house. So you have the cursing, you have the stuff I don't like. Just mm-hmm. just get this out of here. My parents, like my dad wasn't a huge fan of this stuff. He would like roll his eyes at a lot of it, but occasionally something would come up where he's like, oh, I kind of get that. And he was never actively like, you shouldn't listen to this. Um, And that stuck with me. Same thing with my mom. It was never, you shouldn't listen to this. It was always, well, why do you like that? Like, why are you listening to that? With the, with the freedom to choose your, your path, but. Right. And it, and it became now, if they had any sort of like something to say about it, it was always a question. It was always like, well, then, then it starts a conversation. Right. And that's, that, help guide me for most of my life as I approach most things that way. If I don't understand something, I don't go, don't do that. I go, why talk to me and like, make me understand what it mm. is about this. And so that was very freeing for me as far as music goes. Um, so junior high school was a lot of hip hop. I got way into like hardcore German techno too. Um, like for like a year I have like, I have a CD binder sitting over here. That's got like double triple albums of like techno tracks volume 12 and it's all people singing in german to like unce, 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 unce. Wow. and like for a couple of years um and then high school kind of sol- high school is where i solidified to like oh here's what i like um i got way into the blues <laughs> i got mm-hmm. way way into the blues um right. from the cradle mm-hmm. by eric clapton is probably the first blues album i listened to f- like front to back that was eighth grade. I think I listened to that a bunch and just kept listening to it. And my dad was like, you know, there's more blues than Eric Clapton, right? Because he <laughs> loved the blues. The fact that I was listening to it, the Florida Eric Clapton was his favorite guitarist of all time. Uh, close second was Stevie Ray Vaughan. And so the next thing he handed me was a Buddy Guy album. He says, you need to listen to Buddy Guy. You need to listen to him. You need to listen to some Albert King. You need to listen to some BB King. And so I had, right when I started high school, like that summer, my dad just hit me with all this education on blues. And then from there, my appreciation of everything guitar based, like skyrocketed. Wow. You know, I got anything that had any sort of like guitar pentatonic scale based stuff, which I didn't know that's what it was at the time. It wouldn't be until later when I start taking music classes that I recognize that that's what kind of binds all this together. Mm-hmm. Um, I just needed more of it. And so if it was like, mm-hmm. you know, punk or pop punk, I was listening to it. If it was metal, I was listening to it. Just anything that had that drive to it just Mm -hmm. pushed me forward. And so through all of high school and to to this day, I'll listen to just about anything. I tend to lean more toward rock uh, alternative, like the stuff that we came up with, um, like grew up with as far as alternative bands. That's kind of like my classic rock, right? Like with my dad, it was Pink Floyd and The Who and Eric Clapton and all of them. For me, it's, you know, you think about Nirvana, Stone Temple Pilots, you know, um, Foo Fighters, which of the bands that were of, you know, the 90s alt-rock scene, that's the one that we still have pretty much. You know, we don't have much of the alt-rock scene still around for for a variety of reasons. Um, Very similar to the classic rock scene, actually, from the 60s and 70s for a variety of reasons. A lot of those people did not continue on. Um, And so... Yeah, that's that's kind of where my headspace was in high school as far as as my love of music um, got way into that. And then that's when I started learning guitar with you and learning trumpet. Um, so a little bit of jazz got thrown in there when I was learning trumpet. I got way into stuff like that. Ska for a little bit because, hey, there's popular music with trumpets in it. Of course, I'm going to like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm remember, sorry. Again, I remember being rambling. surprised. I remember being surprised by your uh, enthusiasm for the blues. Pleasantly surprised. You know, I was like, Okay, someone likes the blues, and I didn't have to like convince them first. You know? Yeah, yeah it's cool. it's a very old style that a lot of people are like. Nah, I want I want to do metal. I'm like, well, this is the basis of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So that I was I was happy about that, and then I just saw you just naturally carried on because you you're actually passionate about the blues. I, I would I would wager you like the blues a lot more than I do. You know, oh, it's just I- for me it's a part of American music. So, it, and being a teacher and being like a diverse guitar player, I, I am an American. 
I had to right. kind of, it's just a natural expression. Like I, I didn't choose to want it, to like it. I just did it I, because it just comes out of my hands. Maybe because right. of living in New York. I don't know, but um, just, I did it a lot. Uh, and then it's just, it's an easy te- format to teach because it's, it's formulaic, you know? Um, right. It's, it's a formulaic and pattern based. And so without really knowing anything about the musical undertones of like the, the, the uh, music theory under underlying anything you can learn how to play the blues like a professional without knowing a single note really as long as you right. know the patterns like you can you can do a lot with very little um with the blues right. uh, which... i guess i'll guess someone like stevie ray vaughan I, I know a bit about him i mean i listened to him a heck of a lot but i didn't you know i, I don't think he knew much theory at all it was my guess unless unless you know differently um, not, not anything i know differently i know that later in life right before he, tragically he passed he was getting more uh theoretically inclined uh i i think the story goes if i'm remembering correctly the helicopter he was taking that went down he was going to uh, i forget what university it was but he was working with the university on music therapy like trying to figure out like how we can use music to like heal people because he had just gotten clean like mm-hmm. he had spent a lot of time battling addiction and a lot of other things and he had used his music to get himself in a good place and he wanted to build on that and he was working with some university i forget which one it is um mm-hmm. and so he was working more toward that theoretical side of music but much later on not right. that i would i don't think he was very much a theory guy like coming up with double trouble and you know when he was playing right. bars down in texas right yet his his facility was absurd and a lot more than the, the blue scale going on at this point oh yeah no know, where kidding that me? came from but just like you said you learn the format and then you just immerse yourself and then you could play without having to know what, what the notes are or, or much more than just i don't know just letting the guitar speaking through the guitar or something well and then, i mean that's what music's supposed to do right like when you're playing or listening to music it's supposed to speak to pure emotion like you're putting a language together with sounds and you're creating these sounds from the physicality of what you're doing with your hands or your feet in the case of like things like drums and things like that. You're getting your whole body involved with this art form. Whereas with painting, you're using pretty much your hands and your eyes. With photography, you're using your eyes and your framing. With music, you're using something that's kind of very internal as well as the physical here. And that's why music has always stuck like as an important thing for me. Because even as a listener, just hearing what someone can do, even just instrumentally, I got way into instrumental guitar uh, back in like 05 and continue to this day. Andy McKee, one of my favorite guitarists you know, going forward, just listening to pure music. Like there's no lyrics to it. There's nothing else you can imprint on it for meaning other than with the emotion you're getting from what's being played. And for me, that's that's what makes music special as an art form is that you have that, all right, I'm going to play and then something's just going to come out from what I'm doing here. Oh, can you spell his name? I'll put that in the show notes. That was Andy uh, so it's Andy. I, I think McKee is M C K E E. I think that's how he spells it. Any uh, particular album or something you want to record? Uh, any of his stuff's really good. He has like a best of. I think that's out there right now. Um, mm-hmm. If you want to start from the beginning, he has an album called Dreamcatcher. Uh, Art of Motion. I'm sorry. Art of Motion is probably the one you want to start with. It's also mm-hmm. the one he made a splash on YouTube um, a while back. Back in like oh five is how I first heard of him where they showed him playing and he's playing complete finger style in like the, you know, the, the style of, uh, of, of, um, Oh, why am I forgetting his name? Oh man. Tommy Emanuel, uh, like someone like Tommy Emanuel and stuff like that. Um, so really impressive stuff. If you have a chance to check him out and he's one of those, you put it on and you just, what you're feeling is what you feel. Like what, what's coming through the music is just, just this pure, like wash over you. Mm Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, I always love to find new guitars. So, yeah. You know, when people ask me, well, who's your favorite guitarist? So, you know, that's a fun conversation, top yeah. 10, whatever. Um, truthfully, nowadays, uh, I really have no idea. Like, I feel like my, my answers are very kind of uh, stock from like what I've kind of grown up listening. But re- this past year, you know, so when Eddie Van Halen died, Mm. last year right or was it last year uh, i think it was a year ago i want to say it was a year ago. yeah I, I uh what i started to do was um 
I started to, instead of like going up and doing like a tribute to Eddie Van Halen, cause I was, you know, I put out guitar videos and stuff. Yep. I was like, there's no Van Halen song I could do, you know, that's in my repertoire besides right now. And it's not really, yeah. it doesn't represent Eddie Van Halen that much, you know? So I said, you know what I'm going to do and for his spirit? Cause he has no lack of people who love him. Right. I said, I'm going to every day for 40 days, I chose 40. Every day for 40 days, I'm going to discover a new guitarist I never heard and just like nice. like their video and give them an encouraging comment, like an unknown guitarist, preferably. Yeah. And I did that and I came up with a long list. Sometimes I would go back to the same guy because I liked it so much. And then, you know, through doing that, so much of the guitar players that are so fantastic are, of course, not well known or just or newer guys. And uh, <clears throat> so like the who's your 10th favorite guitarist and it's course of all the of course it's going to be like the popular slash and eric clapton and all these guys but really you know when i listen to these other people like the, you know andy mckee I, I never heard of him he's probably incredibly moving you know there's so many i could point to now that i would say these are some of the best guitarists that i've ever heard you know but i don't even know their names right. you know right. it's, off it's... of hand it's the democratization of the tools, right? It used to be that in order to put anything out that people were going to listen to, you had to spend an enormous amount of money, an inordinate amount of money in order to get something listenable. Now you don't like, right now I'm, I'm speaking into a microphone that 20 years ago, someone would have spent three times as much to get the sound I'm getting out of this. I'm sitting in my garage with a mixer that probably would have cost eight times as much, you know, back, back you know, when people were you know, booking studio time. And once the tools came to a point where people can do high quality things on their own, you have this boom through things like Spotify, also just YouTube, the, the guitar YouTube community. I fell down that rabbit hole back in 2014 and still follow a lot of guys that just, there's so many guitarists who are running successful or not successful YouTube channels who just are putting out good work that it's a shame that not as many people know about them. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's, you have just, there's no lack of like, if I was a teenager now coming up with like, I'm interested in guitar. I want to like see who's out there. You have so much more to choose from. Like I'm, I'm genuinely curious to see people who are going to be in their like 20s starting in the next, you know, five years or so what their music sounds like, because they're going to have such a vast variety of people they could have listened to as opposed to just here's the 20 songs we play on the radio. Yeah. So uh, let me just say shout out to Deanna, Deanna Giordano. Hey, watching, Deanna. She says, nothing high Madison school alum. union. Yeah. Hey, say another Madison alum there. Yeah, another Madison alum there. Hey, Deanna. Good, thanks for joining. Hope you're having a good night. Um, and if anyone else who's watching, if you want to chime in and let us know who you are, where you are, and uh, how it's going, please do so. Um, so I'll tell you just a note about that in terms of. Uh, and people coming up in the next five to 10 years, you know, creating music. Uh, when I was teaching some students in the past year or two that were uh, between the ages of seven and, or, yeah, seven and 14 or 15, um, what I'm seeing is that these kids, and like who are talented at music and may go into this, you know, may go into music on some level, uh, Almost, in, and I'm seeing with my own son, um, almost a guarantee that they're going to, they're only going to get multi-instrumentalists more and more. Right. Um, and, that, and I'm not saying they'll never be like a focused instrumentalist again, but probably it's going to dwindle. I can't imagine someone like my son would play guitar and get it really, really good. Of course it's possible, but there's just too many fun options right now. And the level of guitar playing that was achieved by Stevie Ray Vaughan and Eddie Van Halen can't possibly be achieved now because of the, uh, because of the incredible temptations that technology allows. Now you can get the facility, right? But to get to have that creativity that comes with it, that comes from that pure like struggle that that those times kind of engendered. I don't know, maybe I'm. Making too broad an assumption, but See, I was going to say, I'm not sure if I agree on that last point where we're never going to have, or not never, but like we're not, we're less likely to have someone who decides to focus down. Um, 
for as much as there is the temptation, like, listen, I, I'm guilty of the same thing. Like I play guitar as much as I can, but I also have nice keyboard sitting in the corner and I have a little like little drum pad set that I like to mess around with. And I can, you know, get on my microphone and record some stuff and do some stuff. And there's a lot to do, right? I feel that even with all these options, there's still going to be people who are drawn to it. Like, just like there are people in the, listen, Back when Steve Ray Vaughan was coming, learning how to play guitar, he could have spent time playing drums and guitar as well. He could have been looking at bass. You know, he could have been spending all his time driving around with girls and cars instead of spending his time mastering his guitar, right? There's always going to be distractions. There's always distractions, no matter what time period we're talking about. You know, the, the conversation we have around a lot with technology now, things like Facebook and social media, were the same conversations that uh, people had about um comic books and video games when I was a kid or comic books and TV and movie when my dad was a kid and radio when my grandmother was a kid and novels back in the turn of the century, right? Like all these things are going to split the focus of people and it's going to be the end of society. And what we find is that people tend to adapt and grow. And yeah. that's, that, that's the view I'm taking is that yes, we're going to have a lot of people who become instrumentalists or right? multi-instrumentalists. And we're not going to have, we're not going to have maybe as many of the people who are going just for guitar but you're still going to get that one or two in a million who decide, no, this is the thing that speaks to me. You're going to still get that Steve Ravon or that Joe Satriani who, when they touch the guitar, it speaks to them like nothing else does. Um, but the difference is we're also hearing all these other voices. Whereas in the past, we wouldn't hear these voices, right? You know, there, there, were, there were always these people who would noodle around with guitar and they'd be okay with it. And then they kind of go and, you know, stop working with it or they would keep working with it, but we wouldn't hear it because they didn't have a record deal. Now, someone who's halfway decent with guitar, they have a SoundCloud page and they'll put out some decent stuff and you'll listen to it and they'll put it on YouTube and they don't need to have a distribution deal because this isn't their day job and they're just doing, they do enjoy it. And so, yeah, we'll have an explosion of that, which I love. I love that idea of having that like th that class of like, not like the, in photography, we call it prosumer level stuff. Like when you mm -hmm. buy gear, that's not quite pro level, but not quite consumer level. Having like your prosumer, you know, musicians, I know a bunch of people who they still play music, not as their day job, but they do it as like a weekend gig as an excuse to hang out with friends. You know, they record and put stuff out because it's still scratches that creative itch they have. And they have the ability to do it now, whereas they don't have to sink money into studio time and stuff like that. And so I, I think that's where we see the expansion. And I don't know yeah. if that necessarily means we see a shrinkage up top. You know, I think we still will have those people who kind of rise above. And as long as people are still looking for stuff like that, I guess is the thing, you know, and there's always going to be a demand for people working at a high level. I, at least I think so. I tend to take the, the, the optimistic view of that. <laughs> yeah. I, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. I guess what I'm, what I was sensing and pointing towards is that um, uh, you, it, to be, you, if you're going to be a really great instrumentalist, which there, I, there are plenty that can play much, faster, more fluid, possibly more creatively than, uh, than others in previous generations. Certainly a lot technically proficient, technical proficiency. There's plenty of guitarists that are much younger than me that are much more technically proficient than me. I know yeah. that. Again, the, the YouTube guitar like community has so many people I'm watching like, oh my God, like I'm seeing videos of people playing in a way that I, by the day I die, I'm never gonna play as well as they do. Right, right. And, that, that, and that's perfectly, that's great, you know? Um, but I'm also seeing, excuse me, that those people have to develop different skills too. They have right. to develop the skill of learning how to do YouTube videos. Right. They have to develop the skill of learning social media if they're gonna kind of get beyond just playing in their room. And uh, I don't know. So I'm seeing that on the previous generations because of like this guitar hero culture that we've mm. had through the seventies and eighties, where like you worship the guitar player for whatever weird reason. And that guitar player has the luxury to just play guitar all the time, you know, and then get improve. Right. Uh, the people who do it now, they're on more on the, on the ground level and they have to practice and then they have somehow have to make money and they have to learn these other skills so that they can be visible. So they have to right. do videos and all this stuff. So it, and then you have to learn sound engineering too. So you can't, you know, just like, practice your guitar constantly become fast like steve ray one i don't know how many other skills you have 
but he could play guitar like nobody else, right? Right. Like, was he sitting there at the soundboard being like, no, nah, the mids are not right on this one. Like, this is like, he had someone to do that for him. Like, right. he had. So that's kind of what I'm pointing towards, you know? But, yeah. Uh, and I, and I definitely get that. And I, and I, I agree that that's definitely going to change what we view as like the traditional like guitar hero model, right? Where we have these people who that is literally all they do. And my, I'm curious to see how that evolves because right now we're in kind of like the infancy to middle of that. And now does that evolve the way the record industry is involved? Like I'm already seeing some YouTube channels where they're getting so big, like someone like Jared Dines, he's someone who's huge. Uh, not necessarily a guitarist I, I like very much. He's one of those mm-hmm. gent guys where it's like, super low tuned 18 string bases and stuff like that um but he's so big at this point where he has a team of people who are taking care of that stuff them. it's basically he's working in the old studio model but for youtube so he's got a team of people he has someone who edits his videos for him so he doesn't have to edit them he might know how his way around a camera and stuff but he has people who handle that for him now at this point uh and that's where i see a lot of smaller like guitarists doing stuff like that um another guy i I watch a lot i've been watching since he started uh he called himself samurai guitarist his name is steve otero he actually reminds me a lot of you john because in his early stuff he not only was doing these really great kind of jazzy covers of stuff he was also taking the time out to do what he called the sensei series which was talking about like music and life and how they kind of intertwine with each other and so i've always loved his content as he's gotten more popular he's been able to offload some of the work he was doing onto like he can hire someone to do it you know so i'm curious to see how this evolves like does this evolve into all right this person wants to just be able to play guitar and get better are they making enough now to be able to hire a team of people so that they can do that you know and it's interesting to see if we just kind of circle back around to the label model you know yeah i hope not um me too (laughs) i'm hoping people are successful enough to be able to independently hire people to do what they want to do you know Right. Yeah. It should certainly involve a lot of creativity and thinking outside the, the box to yeah. create pa- new pathways, you know? Mm-hmm. God, please. This is He Man. Did you ever hear He Man, Mike? Another one of my favorites. I mm-hmm. don't have one next to me like I did with the Ninja Turtle. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sad to say. Uh, I do have a 10 inch Funko Pop of Skeletor upstairs, though. Uh, my wife is I also waiting. Actually, hold on. Wait a second. Wait a second. I Mike just realized. Says he knows. He knows who he man is, and he also has Skeletor in his house. Can you believe so, that? I down, down go here, to where Leonardo too. So down here, I don't have Skeletor, but I do have Beast Man, a very large Funko Pop of Beast Man from Masters wow. of the Universe. I uh, just picked this up on uh, uh, on discount. Um, so That's yeah, Beast Man, okay. We yeah. just saw Beast Man today when you looked at the. Yeah, computer. I have I have a very understanding wife, is what it is. Um, she also is way into things like He-Man and stuff like that, so it's very nice. Oh wow! Very <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, so moving to uh, another uh, question for you. Yeah. Uh, so when did you start listening to music? We pretty much covered that. So how would you just describe the influence music has had in your life? Being where you are now, with your family, with your the job that you've been in for fourteen years, and uh, being your father and husband and, uh, you know, being you, how would you describe the influence music has had in your life? I mean, it, like I said before, it's one of those things where I recognized it once I started really listening to music and also once I started picking up an instrument, just how much music it's is this question. pure expression, you know, of what's inside you. And so for me, music holds a lot of, just emotional importance. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, I am, for a lot of people who are watching this probably know, I, I worked with you to do the music video for your song, Daddy, right? That's a song that, I first heard it when I was 17. And to this day, I'll still put it on. I'll still listen to it. And it still has meaning for me, right? Because the way I view music is it's something that speaks to you on a very personal level. And it might speak to you the same way, you know, every time you listen to it. More often than not, though, it'll bring something new out every time you're, you're listening to something. Um, a good example of this, uh, when I first became a dad, right? Um, uh, Mikey comes around in 2009. So he, my God, he's going to be 12 soon. Um, he comes around in 2009 and, you know, I just started teaching. I, we were married for about a year at that point, uh, Tara and I, and now we have our first child. So a lot of things are happening all at once. And I was 
to say overwhelmed is just an understatement, right? And so I remember realizing that one of the reasons I think I felt as tense as I was and as overwhelmed as I was at that point was I wasn't taking time out to stop and listen to music the way I used to, say, four or five years earlier when I had a lot more of my free time, like kind of my me time. I would take, you know, maybe an hour to sit down, just listen to music. Not a lot of people do that. And people just put it on. It's a background thing. It's not something you you like pay attention to. It's just kind of the soundtrack to what you're doing. I missed just listening to music. And so I, instead of decrying that fact, was like, okay, I'm going to take the fact that my newborn child despises sleep and I'm going to turn it into a positive here. And it was one of those things where it made what was a very tough thing initially, you know, Mikey not sleeping, your child not sleeping when they're young. Anyone who has young children knows this pain. They, you don't know tired until you know child don't sleep tired. Um, and so I remember, though, finally getting the idea of, all right, I need to be up anyway. Instead of putting the TV on to have something in the background, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to darken the entire living room. And I'm a big tech guy, so I like networking everything in my house. So I networked my entire music collection from my computer in the bedroom into my living room sound system. And so I would sit down with Mikey, all fussing and not wanting to go to sleep. And I'd just start going through albums that were important to me. And we hit on one that he really loved. For some reason, at an early age, Abbey Road was just an album he would kind of calm down to. Maxwell Silverhammer in particular uh, was, or was that Let It Be? I'm trying to figure out what album that was. Um, whichever one Maxwell Silverhammer's on. Um, I think it was Abbey Road. And we would just, every night then, I would sit and we would sit in the dark and we would listen to that music. And so I would hear those songs over and over again. And we'd keep listening to other music as well, but we'd keep coming back to these same few songs. And so now that music is ingrained in that memory for me, right? Me being a new father, holding my newborn child, singing softly to him these songs that my dad had sung to me when I was a little kid. You know, instead of it just being a song that, okay, my dad sang to me and some I remember of my dad and that I liked, it's now something, the memory gets pushed forward. It gets recast. Now it's something that I have memory of me and my son. And it, it made me realize how much I need to just take that time to be able to appreciate what music does and how it can bond together these time periods. So like now if, if the radio comes on and like Maxwell Silver Hammer goes up, Ma Maxwell Silver Hammer is a silly song that's about a mass murderer. I tear up like because it is this memory of me holding my son who was as big as my arm, who is now almost taller than me, you know, mm -hmm. when I first became a dad. It's, it's one of those things where I, it even happened with the theme song to The Office makes me a little weepy because it was always on when I was uh, giving Mikey his bottle each night. It would just be on in the background. And then he would dance to the theme song when he got a little older. And so like that song, it's a tiny little 10 second nothing, but it's something that has a lot of importance to me because of what the, the memories I tie it to. Um, and so I, tr I try to do that with music as often as I can. I, I try to make sure I'm listening to music actively and that I'm making it part of what is happening around me and not just something in the background. That way, when I hear it again or I revisit something, there is that extra meaning to it. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know if I got a little far afield there. Uh, no, that's awesome. Oh, hey, Melissa Morris is there and she ah. uh, sent some love our way. And she's asking if we're still live. Are we still we live, are, Mike? We are still, I believe we're still live. Hold on. Hold on one second. <laughs> Let me check my pulse. Yes, we are still live. Me I can too. confirm. <laughs> thankfully, we are still live. Miss Morris, Melissa Morris. I should. It's still. I, I'm. <laughs> how many years removed now? I still think of her as Miss Morris because she was an amazing teacher over at Madison High School. I believe she's back at Madison High School now. I believe so. Yeah. Um. And, uh, just she's joining our uh, hangout here. That's so I was gonna say uh, along with you. So the around the same time I started learning guitar with you, John Henry, I wound up because of what I learned from you. I decided I was okay to join guitar ensemble in Madison. And she wound up being one of my first guitar teachers at Madison. And man, some great memories there too. My, my goodness. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, Miss Melissa Morris says she's living the dream, teaching music in uh, Madison. Yeah, I, I, I would say she is living the dream because when she started, she was a young, bright-eyed, uh, early 20-something and giving people enthousi uh, enthusiastically teaching people, inspiring yeah. us. And she's still doing that somehow. And she still looks like she's a young 20 something <laughs> somehow. I, I was going to say, if, if you'll indulge me for a second, John, I, I want to share one of my enduring memories 
uh, of, of Melissa Morris sure. is so the, the year that I'm well, my junior year of high school, I've been learning guitar for about a year at that point. Uh, NISMA is coming around. Uh, for those who don't know, the New York State School Music Association Conference, right, where they have all the competitions and the bands get, get adjudicated is what they say. They get judged and they have mm-hmm. solos. And now I'd been going to NISMA as part of like whatever band I was in for Madison. But that year she had convinced me, well, you should do a solo because I was in her guitar ensemble class. You should do a solo. And I, I had no confidence and, and I still struggle with confidence a lot. I had zero confidence and she had said, you should do it. Like we have an easy piece you can do. You go and add as a level one and it'll be fine. And then she proceeded to take at least two periods a week out of her own time to sit with me and work with me on this one piece that to this day, it's Moorish dance. It was the uh, something no Dennis node, I think was the guy who arranged it to this day. I pick up a guitar is one of the first things I play. If I go to a guitar store, because it's something that's just under my fingers, that that is how much I play that song. And it, it was no matter how frustratingly I was not getting it, she was always very patient. She was always, like you said, very enthusiastic about everything. And like there were times where I'm like, I'm never going to get this. And she was like, no, nah, it's fine. You got this. And just would break it down into smaller pieces for me. And it just <laughs> kind of showed me what it was to really kind of throw yourself into a single piece of music. And I have to say, once I became a teacher, I just doubly appreciated the time she was taking to kind of sit and do that with me because it's one of those things. Now I, I understand as I take time to work with students, you know, on things they need to work on in my own time. Like it's, I understand just how much that can just be a part of your day. Like that, that's not a small thing to give your time like that. And so I've always been very thankful for that. And that's always just, a, just a, an enduring memory for me of my high school years is her working with me uh, on those, on that song. Wow, yeah, that, that's that's a great story, and it reminded me. Uh, I have a few comments I want to get to. Um, she said she's blushing. Um, <laughs> uh, she said, I, I remember that, and a lot of enthusiastic comments from her, uh, you know, as you were speaking. Um, and also, to her credit, I have to, I, similarly, uh, I, maybe it was a year or two before that experience you had, she uh, encouraged me to do an ISMA solo piece, and, you know, she honored that I was an advanced guitarist and she let me sit in the closet during the guitar class. Cause I, I was like, I have to be part of this, <laughs> you know, new guitar class in Madison. Yeah. But I'm like, you know, I don't want to learn, go really learn the basics. It didn't really make sense. So she's like, you could be in it. You sit in the closet, you hand out the guitars and in between you could practice this more advanced stuff, but it was finger style, which I, you know, I wasn't, I was fairly new to. Well, it's, it's funny because th- that turned me on to fingerstyle guitar. Like we were talking about Andy McKee before. My work with Ms. Mars on that piece really made me love and appreciate what fingerstyle does. I'm sorry, John. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, you. I have to say, in my, my love of fingerstyle, uh, you know, I came into high school appreciating it, kind of, you know, distantly wishing I could be a part of it. But then when she came around and there were acoustic guitars, uh, classical guitars, and someone to give me pointers on actually growing the nails and all that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and then reading music because I hadn't really been reading music before high school. I, I knew how to, but I didn't like it. Yeah. Shifting um, from guitar to to guitar music was a yeah. bit of an adjustment. <laughs> yeah, right. And so we learned Bore in E minor. And mm. uh, it was like painstaking, you know, line by line, which I think, I think it's level four. And mm. uh, that was the highest level I ever learned in classical. I never really mastered anything beyond that. I could play at that level, I guess, still. But uh, that was one of the few, maybe three pieces that I, I can, I just like can whip out of memory because of how many times I repeated that for the It's just in your fingers at that point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she says uh, differentiating instruction with her nerd glasses on. And then she eh. said, you guys, you guys were critical to the building of that program. I treasured you guys. So thank well, you. It's, it's, it's interesting. So, uh, Melissa, I have to say, to, as a teacher, I remember my second year teaching uh, as a teacher, my my principal, uh, well, he was the assistant principal at the time. He's the principal of the school now, had asked, he goes, I want you to think back to teachers that you remember doing like a great job, like th- that you would like to be like. And it was it was you and Mr. Dumont, who was a chemistry teacher at Madison, who I talked about. And it, for you, it was specifically that it was the amount of time and your willingness to be flexible. And that was something that, again, it was when I 
the lesson from my principal was think back to what worked for you as a student and that's what you should be trying to achieve. And so the lessons that you were teaching me back then when I was a student, like you were even, you were without realizing it, teaching me what it was to be a good teacher. And those are things I still think about and try to include when I go and do my job now too. So if that helps make you blush a little more um, mm -hmm. because you've been very, you know, instrumental haha, um, in making what I do as a teacher, what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I've always uh, similarly uh, have held her as a model of, uh, yeah, mainly her just the devotion to want the kids, the students to, to succeed. You know, I just remember that. And uh, her willingness to just throw her energy and be very positive to everyone in the class. You know, I always remember that. And I'm sorry, I'm going to share one more that's going to embarrass her. So that same year that we did NISMA, uh, you also had us doing uh, flamenco guitar. And so that was a style I was not familiar with, but I was loving the piece we were doing. And that was the year I forget the name of the piece, but every single one of us, I think, had a solo at some point where we all walked up to the microphone, did a small solo, walked away. And everyone else would just vamp in the background and everyone would walk up, do a little solo and walk away. I remember, and again, struggling for my entire life with confidence. I walk up, I go up and do the solo. And as I do it though, I don't even look at the audience. I'm looking at the ground. I'm looking at my guitar. I'm looking at my feet. I did not want to look at the audience. And I'm sitting there and I play. And I'm like, oh man, I'm thinking this is terrible. This is awful. Uh, whatever. I play my solo. And I turn without looking at the audience. She forced me to stop and look at the audience who was clapping. Two oh, seconds. Nice. All it took was two seconds. Just right, said, right. look, I want you to look. Mm -hmm. And I looked. And I will never forget that. Because everyone was clapping. Because it was fine. It was good. I, you know, I should have right. been looking, right? Mm -hmm. And so, it, it, again, it was one of those moments that stuck with me. And so it was one of those things I try to push forward to my students of like, no, you should be more confident in what you do because you are doing some good stuff here. Yeah. Well, and uh, yeah, her, she's, uh, she said she was blushing and now teary. And <laughs> yes, she remembers that night. Otmar Lieber, maybe that's the composer of the piece. I don't know. Mm. Um, I so, think, yes. Yeah. So uh, I just have to go back to another comment uh, that Thomas left a while back, just so we don't lose it. Uh, he said, is in the middle of the Melissa Morris story, stories group, he said that, uh, I remember Mike Amara, you had to literally break up a few fist fights in the classroom. It wasn't pleasant to watch. Love the novels I read in your class, Gathering Blue and Lord of the Flies. So. Well, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad the novel stuck with you like that. That is something of as an English teacher. That is something that I'm I, more than anything. If you can leave my class with nothing other than an enjoyment of what we have read and discussed and a deeper like understanding of like what the author was trying to teach us. That's one of the things I love about literature. It is very much about the human condition when it's done right. Like it can speak to you so completely and so personally, similarly to music. Um, that a good story, I am a firm believer that just like in music, a good story can change a person's life. It can change someone's outlook. It can touch someone because it's happened to me. There have been books that I've read that have totally shifted how I view the world. And it's one of those things where as an English teacher, it's one of the reasons I wanted when I became a teacher to be an English teacher is I want to make sure that people, especially in the age group we're talking about, I, I struggled a lot in junior high school and especially with things like reading and writing. And the idea that I would be teaching other people, no, 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 this is actually fun. Like you can get a lot from this is, you know, what I'm hoping that students take away from that as thank you, Thomas. That's excellent to hear. Yeah. And, and I was in, impressed about the, the breaking up fights thing that, <laughs> that, you know, I've been in, in, in situations in classrooms where things got really rough and tough and to get in the middle of that, that, that takes some, uh, it, it is what it is. Or, you, you know, know you, it you, is what it you is. never want to, yeah. you never want to see anyone get harmed or hurt or anyone get themselves in more trouble than they should because they did something silly. Um, you know, listen, we're, we're dealing with people at an age where they're making decisions that aren't in their best interest a lot of times. And yeah. someone makes a mistake. Unfortunately, if it goes too far, it can really detrimentally, detrimentally affect their life. And so you never want to see something like that happen. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. You're just really present to that. Um, so since uh, Melissa Morris joined, I was actually, maybe I just sensed her, she was about to join. I remembered that we, I'm calling this uh, music and education bonda. So maybe we could speak a little yeah. bit about the education. We, we are, I mean, because it's all about teaching as well as life and fatherhood and everything. 
Uh, but, um, I, I will say, if we're getting more toward education, I just have to say as a disclaimer, I am not representing the Department of Education in any way. Uh, I'm right, not right. representing as a teacher. I'm re representing myself as an individual. I just want to make sure that is clear. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I, I, I certainly didn't. I didn't intend for you to represent. Uh, no, no, no. That's. Uh, I'm just. Know? I'm just putting that out there, and that's. I'm perfectly fine with wherever this the conversation goes. I just always want to make sure I, I mention that uh, the Department of Education can be a little squirrely sometimes if you're like pr representing them, even like implicitly. Like if you don't say, like if I didn't say like, oh no, this has nothing to do with Department of Education, they might be able to say, oh, you're representing us here, which I'm sorry, go ahead, man. I, I didn't mean to- Yeah, no, hey, that, that's, uh, that's something I didn't even think about, you know? So um, basically I was gonna just say, what do you think is the value of uh, learning music or incorporating music into education? Um, there's a lot. <laughs> there's, it's, it's funny, so, one of the reasons I'm happy with where I teach is we have, uh, currently we have a leader. He was, Mr. Kuzumano is our principal. He was an assistant principal when I started there. He started there as a teacher. Um, he is someone who talked a lot to us about the value of, yes, our academics are very important, but we also need to make sure that what a lot of schools don't have are the kind of like shop style classes or like ancillary skill classes, things like band. Band has always been a very important thing in the school where I teach. Uh, they've had a very robust band program for a long time. And whenever there would be things like budget cuts or things like that, band would always be something they would make sure they keep because they saw the value in it. Um, as far as I see the value for something like band specifically, for me, it was tenfold. One, I've mentioned my struggles with confidence. That helped a lot. Uh, being part of a large group, learning a new skill and having a community of people around me who are all about, hey, we're going to get better at this together is not something you normally get in a high school, traditional high school setting, right? You're not surrounded by a bunch of people all working toward a singular goal. With band, you are. And it's everyone's trying to do the best they can there. And you have the option of you could tear down the person next to you who's messing up or you can turn and try to help. And if you try to tear them down, you're going to hurt the entire group so you're going to turn and try to help them more than anything. So for people who struggle with things, it shows them there are others that can be compassionate. And for those who have a choice of being compassionate or not compassionate, they're shown the value of compassion. If just compassion by itself is of value, but to show a teenager, no, compassion betters everybody is something that being part of a band shows you. Um, mm -hmm. Music also helped me a lot with math, funny enough. I was and continue to be not great with math. I used to be terrible with math um and i remember there was a sharp uptick once i started really getting into the music theory side of music once i started doing things like working on solo pieces on guitar looking at complicated trumpet pieces having to subdivide and making just counting internally making yourself count internally as you do things just changes your relationship with numbers it does <laughs> as someone who despised numbers before band and then tolerated them because i needed to afterwards my relationship with numbers changed drastically once i had to internalize them once i had to get a feel for what math was because that's what music is it's math as a physical thing and that really helped me personally as far as just understanding math a little better um and then yeah. but let me more pause than... you for a second yeah, yeah. Uh, just um so melissa says uh, it's so true mike a story can change your life that, that was for the story point and then she says about uh, i suppose your experience with uh, math and confidence building she said that that's so true too um yeah i, I just uh, want to remember about um band myself just to chime in with you uh because i was coming from you know this advanced musician going into the school to play trumpet or, or to play in band. I was like, but I, come on, I've been, I play music all the time. I want to show right. the world. And, but it was, it was a humbling experience. that was good, healthy for me because it did put me in this boat where I was equal to everyone. And as a trumpet player, I was nothing special. I had to build mm. from the ground up and uh, you know, my mind was advanced, but my skills were not. So I still had to learn and uh, yeah, that, that whole thing, like we're in this together and that, that feeling of, uh, I got to try just as hard as everyone else. I don't get a free, this is my, my perspective. I don't get a free pass because I've practiced tons more hours than, and, right. than some of the other people here, you know, or because I, I lead my own rock band on the side, metal band. I still am just equal with everyone here and I got to try too, if this is going to work out. 
just like everyone else. And that was a humbling thing in a good way that I think a lot of my peers in the heavy metal rock scene maybe didn't go through mm. and therefore their egos were a little bit more uh, out of control because they didn't, they weren't sort of taught how to manage it for the benefit of all type of thing, you know? Well, I got to say that that whole scene mentality is just such a toxic thing. I remember that too, that the idea of you like this or you like this or you're into this or you're good at this. And if you say, oh, I'm into metal, you know, okay, well, pr prove it. You got to like <laughs> prove your bones. Who do you listen to? How many of their albums have you listened to? I, I always despise that because I listen, like I said, like I told you, I listen to a million different things. And so I would get pretty much everyone from every scene would look down on me. <laughs> they were just like, oh, you listen to this? Ugh. And you know, you're, you're not really, you're not really into Scott. Oh, you're into this. You're not into metal. You know? And that sort of nonsense mm. drove me away from certain musical scenes. And yeah, band was one of those where it was like, no, music's bringing us together. Like music is something where we're going to, and listen, it wasn't everybody there. You're always going to have some bad apples in the bunch, right? There was always one or two kids who would just you know, talk trash about you after band class or something about how terrible you are and this, and because they need to feel better about themselves or whatever the nonsense is. And the grand majority of it though, was this, no, no, you're not part of a scene. You are part of a collective. And I got to tell you, John, it's one of those things where I saw it with you as an instructor. And now when, as I'm becoming an instructor, being put into that position of, oh, I know what it's like to be starting from square one after having achieved somewhere else. Now I'm back at square one helps make you a much better instructor. I found because mm -hmm. you're understanding the struggle and it's fresher in your mind. And I have to say, you've always been someone who was always very open with, I want to show you something, or I want to tell you something, or I want to try to teach you something like, be it like a lick on trumpet, be it something on guitar or like it's something where it's just a concept you want to talk about. Right you've always been very open with wanting to share something with someone rather than being um, a gatekeeper of something. And mm -hmm. so that, that's something where, yeah, it's my positive experiences with band have been very similar to what you're explaining here, where it's like this experience of everyone in one group as opposed yeah. to. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Thank, thank you. I would like to, to, com to comment on that. I also want to keep up with our, uh, yeah, yeah. Our, our friends here who are chiming in. So Melissa Morris says, uh, Authentic learning opportunities are critical for all students. So I think she's talking about like that real balanced approach to really give everyone an equal opportunity to, to grow. And, right. And, uh, and having, and having like a real moment, like it's not something contrived. It's, it's something like you have this struggle leads to a breakthrough and you, you're going through something that's real world rather than something that's prescribed. Uh, when right, we're talking about self, authentic. Yeah. Yeah, when we're talking about authentic tasks and authentic learning, um, there's like the there's the constructive struggle that that has to happen a little bit before you get to the point where you're you're really truly learning something there. Mm, which is a challenge for a teacher to know that he or she has to put the students in that situation <laughs> again and again, right? Yeah, <laughs> and hold yeah. That, that that tension, you know. I feel for you guys. Real real world, she says. Melissa says. So Melissa said that. Uh, uh, complimented me that uh, how I intellectualized tonalities was extraordinary uh, and envious of my view on music learning. I appreciate that. Yeah, I always felt with Melissa Mars that uh, we had like, um, I, I don't know, calling her a sibling if she'd be offended by that, but <laughs> uh, but I, something like that. I mean, I know she's, she's my senior, but um, this, this friendly bouncing, um, it's not a rivalry. But I learned from it, her. And, and it's the idea, of yeah. the idea of collaborating with someone yeah, rather than someone. Vibe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. And I I just, somehow her and I, you know, and you you and, and Melissa as well, we've been able to keep this uh, friendship going beyond the school years uh, in a natural, healthy way. So I think that was, that's really Im impressive. You know, I have had a few students in my life that when I was teaching in the school system that have uh, remained my friends and I could certainly text them or I, I can call them um, actually. Uh, one guy I spoke to on the phone who I taught in 2007, 2008, uh, just uh, last week. And he's like, hey, Mr. Mr. Sheridan, I think about you all the time. I never forgot anything you taught, you know, stuff like that. Um, it's just uh, nice to be a part of someone's life 
in a way that it's it's similar to a parent, right? Being a teacher, like you have a role, you have a responsibility. This is something you're doing it from your own sense of vow, kind of like your own vow to be to do your best in in your life, and then it's going to have a ripple effect. And when we see that ripple effect come to us years later, it there's a it's just profoundly joyful because you don't expect it. You know, you're not waiting for it, but when it comes, it's like, ah, okay. So I was actually, uh, you know, I was doing good by my myself and others on my path, you know? Yeah. Like, like I mentioned, that's one of the reasons why I wanted so badly to go into something like teaching rather than what I was doing previously, because I wanted to feel like I was doing something of value that was going to make a difference, at least for some people. And I've had the experience too, where uh, so my, my students are, I have some students who are in their thirties now at this point, that's how old I'm getting. Um, uh, and I have students now who I've had students reach out to me on the regular, just to see how I'm doing, let me know how they're doing uh, because they know that I genuinely care about their well being and like where they're going in their lives. And I've been very lucky to see a lot of people reach out and be like, Hey, just to let you know, here's this cool thing I'm doing or like, here's how I've been. And, they, they've just been able to share and like, I'll get the occasional just thank you, which is always nice to hear. Um, I remember w one student I had, she had written, it was her high school acceptance, I'm sorry, college acceptance letter, you know, because I'm, I'm teaching junior high school. I don't see them again for like four years. Um, a lot of them don't reach out until after they're done with high school. And this college acceptance letter was all about just a conversation I had had with this student. And that I just felt like the student needed a conversation. And we sat down and talked just because they were having a rough day. And I didn't realize how much that conversation was going to mean to that person. And then they sent me this, here is what I wrote to help me get into this college. And it was about that experience of that conversation. And it was just, it helps to have that validation sometimes. You know, you don't do it for the validation. You do it because you, you believe in what you're doing. But seeing that validation just, it, it, it like energizes you for the next like 10 years worth of your career. Um, if you know you're doing that for at least one person out there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it certainly wouldn't pay to, to wait for the uh, validation because waiting uh, 10, 14 <laughs> years is a long no. time, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it's natural. We, we think like, hey, we tried our best. And sometimes in my experience teaching, there are days when it feels thankless. Like I just jumped absolutely. Green and what the fuck, you know, what the heck. But yeah. Uh, but then there are those days where it's just like, there are a tsunami of love comes your way or, or weeks or whatever, months, errors. Yeah. And it, it just oh, and yeah. it just reminds you it's like okay yeah. right. okay this yeah. is making a difference <laughs> yeah so thomas the bone says that mike amara you were the first one to introduce me to the word broad broad <laughs> that's that's, that's cool. pretty that, that says something right like uh, in yeah. uh, junior high school to have someone introduce you to the idea of broad like there's <laughs> there's, there's much larger there's, view that's possible you know there's more to the world than than what your narrow view is yeah yeah, and and she's and Melissa says that makes me feel really old. I guess when I guess when you said <laughs> how you you're feeling old. I yeah, I have students who <laughs> listen. You, listen, you you weren't that much older than us, okay? When you were teaching <laughs> us, there you go. You you you're, you're close enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're you're in a, you can be in a club. Um. So uh, yeah, let me uh, ask you another question. Yeah. If you're here for it. Of course. Um. So. Uh, hmm. There's a lot of different ways to go. Um, what, what is, how would you describe your philosophy on life? Um, it, it's funny cause that depends on what stage of my life you would have been asking me that, right? Like it's one of those things that's been very fluid for me. I've noticed, um, certain things have been fluid. Certain things haven't, um, currently my, my whole kind of outlook, and this is something that I've had to kind of push myself toward over the last, I don't know, I want to say five to eight years. I don't know. It's making sure I'm doing things purposefully, you know, making sure that I'm living life on purpose is how I jokingly say it to people. Uh, a lot of the life we tend to live is just happenstance. Like we happen to wind up in the school we're in because of where we live and like where we grew up, right? We happen to go into a major we go into because, well, Maybe our choices were limited. Maybe it was something that sounded good at the time. And maybe you wind up working somewhere for a few years because you happen to know someone who worked in that field. And it's none of it is something you're out and out going after and choosing. And all of those things apply to things that were happening to me well into my 20s. You 
you know, the, the previous career I had of doing graphic design. Yes, I was learning graphic design because I wanted to learn it and I was enjoying doing it. I can do it freelance, but I wound up working for three years and possibly could have stayed there for my entire career working graphic design because someone I knew was like, Hey, we have an opening. Why don't you come, you know, see how you do with this. And I wasn't going for the job because I absolutely wanted to do graphic design. It was an opportunity and I took it and it was something I kind of like fell into. And that was great. It was a great opportunity. It was able to get me started on like my adult life. It was able to allow me to make enough money to start thinking about things like getting married. But then I had to make a decision. It was, do I continue to live this life where things are just kind of happening to me? Or do I take the bull by the horns, right? Do I go and like, I'm going to make things happen to me that I want to have happen for me. And so that's going into education was one of those first big things where I'm like, okay, I need to look for a job where I'm going to feel validated and I'm going to feel good about what I do. And those can be a few different things. And teaching was one of those things I was already doing with tutoring. And then it was like, all right, I had, I had been having a lot of trouble before meeting my wife with a lot of the ways relationships had been going. And I'm, I'm looking back, it was a lot of that was partially more, probably more than partially my fault, how I was approaching things. And a lot of it was, I was meeting people just through happenstance. I was meeting them through where I happened to be. And so I got a bit more active about it, doing things like online dating and looking for, like I had a very specific view of where I wanted my life to go romantically. And so I tried to seek out people who would be of a similar mindset. And I found that once I started doing that, once I started telling myself, okay, here's what you want. Start making moves to do those things. Things started happening in a positive way for me. And so that's, I started teaching and I started this whole new career. I met this wonderful woman who I'm still married to was 2008. So we're talking 14 years, uh, 14 years, no, um, 13 years later, right? 13 years. Later. I'm terrible with math. I mentioned I'm terrible with math. A lot of years later, we're still married. We have two children, you know, and it's one of those things where like, okay, we were, you know, renting an apartment and it became time to decide, do we continue renting for the entirety of whatever? Or do we make some sacrifice and push and go get a house? And it was like decision time. And it was every time I thought about, well, where do I want my life to go? I have to actively pursue something. And the more that happened, the more good things were happening. And it even started happening professionally where you've mentioned archery, right? Like I love doing archery. I started shooting archery back in 2005 and I've been doing it ever since and done a couple of competitions and I got my certifications. I started thinking to myself, ah, it would be crazy if I can do this like in the schools, right? Like, man, they would never let me do this in the schools. And then even people told me, oh yeah, no, that'd be nuts. They would never let you do it. And old me would have been like, yeah, no, that's nuts. Don't do that. But then I'm like, no, I, I want to try. I'm probably going to get told no, but this is something that's important enough to me. I want to give kids the opportunity to do something I didn't have an opportunity to do. I'm going to push this a little bit. And lo and behold, a year and a half after that, I wound up getting all of this equipment donated to us from the Easton Foundation. We wound up having a huge program just in my school. And then that grew to three more schools. And now we currently have, of course, COVID made sure that we couldn't do it the last year and a half. Um, but for seven years running now, we have had a New York state championship with seven different middle schools in like the Queens, Brooklyn area. And that's all because I decided I want to do this. And I want, I think this is important and it's, I've been doing more of that. Like, Oh, wouldn't it be crazy if, and then instead of saying, ah, oh, that's nuts. Don't do that. Why not? It's why I reached out to you about doing a video with you. I'm like, I would love to do a video. I want to do a music video. This song is important to me. And Old me would have been like, John is going to laugh at me. Like, no way in hell he'd want to do a music video with me or I don't have like the bona fides to do it. And me and I was like, why not? Just try it. What's the worst that can happen? And so I've been, I've been trying to live life through that philosophy um, and making sure that I'm being more just, again, just, uh, I've lost it. The word I- Proactive, I right? Proactive yeah. and being so a creative. Bit more, a, a bit more proactive with, with how I, I, I live my life. Uh, again, more purposeful, I'm sorry, with how I'm living things. Um, and yeah. the, the other thing I'll mention is that, especially again, being reflective after my 20s, um, as I became a husband and as I started becoming a father, being reflective on how I may or may not have been the best person to people around me, right? And you know, all of us look back at ourselves when we were younger and we're like, oh no. <laughs> like we think about ways we've treated people and 
of like how we've approached situations. I am, and being a teacher has helped with this a lot, is I'm trying to make sure I approach everything with the maximum amount of kind of kindness and understanding toward people. Like I will always approach a situation where I'm trying to understand where another person's coming from and try like just a constant state of de-escalation where it's just like someone's <laughs> getting a bit was like, all right, cool. No problem. What's happening? Like, and trying to be a bit more understanding with other people around me. And that has also been working really well. Like that's been, that means a lot of my relationships have been a lot more positive. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's so good. So I'm going to pause you there and, and just yeah. we'll dive a little deeper and let you know that uh, Deanna, our friend Deanna Giordino says, yes, make waves. I guess when you're talking <laughs> about the archery and just in general, how you were taking control of your life. And she says, I have amazing friends. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you. We have amazing friends too. People like yourself and Melissa and Thomas the Bone and Lisa and everyone else who's watching. I was gonna, I, I always say that I'm I'm a person, I'm a normal person surrounded by some of the most interesting people in the world. Like I've been lucky to be surrounded by amazing people. And then Melissa Morris says, uh, reflecting is such a critical skill and it's not such a common thing for people. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, it's critical, it's super valuable. And if more people were taught that skill, it would be a good thing, right? That we I wish teach, I did it sooner. You know? Like I wish I had, I had done it sooner. I wish in my early to mid twenties that I was a bit more reflective about who I was and how I was acting toward people. Cause again, you think back and you're just like, Ooh, I want to smack old me. Like I want to, I want to have a talking to with young me. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, that, great answer to that. Thank you. Um, do you have any setbacks that you feel comfortable to share? No pressure in which music has helped you pull through. Hmm. I'm trying to think of any like major setbacks. Um, not that or, I could really think of it. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. Like, or a dark night of the soul. Whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. I, I, it's specifically setback. I do have something. So, and this actually speaks to my relationship with your music. Um, so I just said like my early twenties, I wish I can go back and kind of smack young me. Right. So in my early 20s, I had this very large cast of ennui come over myself, um, partially because my, my father's health was getting worse, partially because that's what happens when you're in your early 20s and going to college and trying to figure out what your life's going to be. And I was just, I, I was probably the most unbearable person to be around for the people who are close to me. I apologize to anyone who knew 21 to 23 year old Mike. It was just probably not a great situation because I found myself constantly questioning, well, what am I doing? Where am I going? And instead of reflecting positively about it, I would say like, this all sucks. This is terrible. It's never going to get better. And this is all just garbage. And uh, around the start of college, I decided to go to John Jay for forensics. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the guy who eventually was a medical examiner. That, that was the job I wanted to do. I wanted to be Dr. Michael Badden from Autopsy on HBO. Um, and I got into John Jay and then found out that you know, forensic science is real hard. <laughs> really hard like really really hard like they told us during our orientation hey just so you know look around 10 percent of you or less will be here in three years the rest of you are going to either drop out voluntarily or flunk out that's how tough the program is and sure enough within two years i realized it wasn't what i wanted to do um not so much because of, of the of how difficult the math was very difficult but it was they had us do a class called um a quantitative analysis uh, it was a lab class you had to take on a Saturday that took eight and a half hours. It was a work day. And part of the reason they had to do that because they need you to do long-term studies like that you're doing. And they wanted you to see what a work day was like. And I'm forever thankful that John Jay did this. The professor was like, listen, this is your work day when you get out of here. This is what your work day is going to be like for at least the first five to 10 years of your career. If this is not what you want to do, you need to reflect on that now. And I panicked because I couldn't do it. Like, I'm like, this is, I can't be in a lab like this for this many hours. I'm going to go crazy. And that, sent me, <laughs> that sent me into an emotional free fall. Like I didn't know what to do, you know? And at that point, my father had just passed a few months after that 9 11 had happened. So everyone was in kind of a funk. And so I, I was just lost. And a lot of what kind of pulled me through and got me thinking about what was important to me was listening to a lot of music that was important to me. 
um, listening to a lot of my dad's old blues albums, just, you know, for the, the sake of being a connection with him. And then it was, I think, I want to say it was your CD release party. Um, I hadn't been to a live show since like middle of high school at that point. Like I hadn't seen live music since I had started college. And it was one of those things where I didn't realize how much I had missed live music. And I went to one of your shows and it was, you know, it was you, I think I, I forget exactly what it was, but like, it was just feeling that live energy galvanized me and like made me feel alive for the first time in probably two years, like in a way that I had felt when I was in high school. I'm like, oh man, this, this is great. Like, oh man, like this is what I'm missing. I need more creative things like in my life. Like that's what drives me. That's what I love. And so I started falling way more into the creative side of things. That's how I became a creative writing major at Brooklyn College. When the transfer to Brooklyn College happened, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. It was part of my language. Sorry. I didn't know what I was going to do. And the idea of my very strong feeling that uh, the right story can change your life and the creative desire in me led me to some great years. Like once I became a creative writing major, I loved what I was doing. And then, yeah, a big part of me enjoying college way I did was being you know, being present whenever live music was happening. So live music helped kind of pull me out of a big funk for a while. And, you know, I started going to live music shows that I wouldn't otherwise go to. I remember I went to uh, Smalls was a jazz club that closed down, unfortunately, back in like 04, 05, something like that, um, that I went to a couple of performances there and jazz was never a big thing for me, but I loved mm -hmm. the energy, like just being down there, like in that scene, just hanging out was something that just, it fed me like in my early twenties uh, that otherwise I would have just withered a little more had I not had that, like th that music to nourish me a little bit. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was going to ask about um, having any live experience moments that, that you remember. Um, yeah. It, it might've been the, the CD release party of Brooklyn folk. It sounds like uh, that was at the elbow room. I was playing with Jason yes. and yes, uh, yes, yes. Patrick on, on a stage um, in October, October 24, 2001. Um, yeah. But I know you've seen me at various occasions in that era, I think. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally know what you're talking about when you in a down, downward spiral of sorts and then you experience some magic whether it be music or some other art or something that just moves your soul and you're like oh yeah i gotta be around more of this you know that and it's funny i i have one more from that time period so you mentioning the date reminded me um like right before that too so right when i was in the middle of this funk i was still at john jay um a couple of mutual friends of our uh jay batch jeremy bachelor and jason donnelly um they they had an extra ticket to a dream theater show um, that was at the Roseland Ballroom. It was it was for Scenes from My Memory, um, the album Scenes from Memory. Now, I had tangentially known Dream Theater as a band just from being friends with them. I'd never really listened to them. Um, for those who don't know, Scenes from a Memory is a 75 minute long concept album. It is basically one song beginning to end. <laughs> um, and so they had an extra ticket. They weren't going to charge me for it. They're like, dude, just come see the show. Frank couldn't make it. And so I'm like, and again, I was like, I didn't know. I, mean, I was all like in a bad <laughs> mood, but I went down there and I then proceeded to watch the most just moving like performance I'd probably seen live. They did this amazing beginning to end album. Like I had never heard a minute of that album. The whole thing floored me. I went and bought it that night. We found a Virgin Records. I bought the CD that night and oh, yeah. I listened to that thing constantly. Um, because not only was it a great album musically, it told it a great story. Like as a concept album, I love concept albums because I love stories. And so as a concept album is an amazing concept album. And so, but here's the best thing about that concert. They did that 75 minutes. They took a 20 minute break and then did another hour and a half of their other stuff. And so wow. literally I was just like a gape looking at the, the stage and like, Jason Donald was just like, look over there, look what he's doing. I don't know that. Look over there, look what he's doing. And it, again, it kind of like, here's what humans can do. Like it opened my heart to like, people can do astounding things with music and creativity. Like you need this in your life. Like you should be happy about this stuff. And so that helped me too. Like, again, yeah, I, I just realized like that time period, I went to a lot of live music, both locally and like bigger stuff. Um, but yeah, sorry. That was another really like 
big moment because I was again I was real down like it was August I want to say it was August of 2001 I was like man things just couldn't be worse for me at that point and I I loved I walked out of there feeling like a different person you know good yeah that's good to hear uh I just want to let you you know and other guys know uh so there's this cool website I don't know if you're aware of it um which I discovered because in the process of writing my book uh I'm I'm really fascinated by timelines so Mm. there's so many live shows I've been to that I'm like how can I factor that into my story it might be cool if I could speak about but I have no idea where it is yeah so it's a a website called setlist.fm and you can search an artist uh the city the year and no there's kidding. a good chance you could find the specific show that you went to. Oh my goodness. You know, and you could, if you're, if you join it, then you could say I was at that show and you could even add to the set list if you remember anything. Oh, that's incredible. So people can also comment with like memories of the show too. Uh, I haven't seen that. You, uh, they you that? Just, no, that would be cool. Uh, that would be interesting that. to see. But um, yeah, like that would be, because like I have a distinct memory of seeing uh, when my first, my first live show was Aerosmith again, going back to Aerosmith. Um, I remember it was, geez, I must've been junior high school. must've been like 12, 13. Um, I remember my dad picked me up from little league and then making an, like he like pulled up and stopped short one, like parked the car said, you wait here, runs into a store, comes running out like 30 minutes later. He had went to the little ticket master kiosk that was in like the whiz or something. Mm -hmm. And he had gotten tickets to Jones beach to see Aerosmith for the get a grip album, the album, which I'd gotten the previous Christmas that I was playing nonstop on my stereo in my room. And so he comes out with two tickets for me and him to go see. And that probably stands as still my favorite like live music memory because it was a generational gap thing. My dad was a huge Aerosmith fan, you know, when they were first, you know, Aerosmith, you know, in the in the seventies. And then now here I was in the nineties, a big fan of their newer stuff. And we were both just enjoying the hell out of that show. And it was a great live show. And it was the first time I had seen something that large scale, like seeing like a big band on a stage like that with a crowd like that. That was, uh, again, band, it was. And you, you like too. Yeah. Um, oh, are you kidding yeah. me? It was, J- it was an J- album. Yeah. If you, if you got into them during pump, then forget about it. By that time, you must have thought they were, you, you know, super cool. In your mind. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so I was a I just, super fan. I just checked it out. Uh, 19 Aerosmith 1993 Jones Beach and it says September 4th and September 5th they played at Jones Beach. So you, whichever one was the Saturday. Yeah, and you could look at them your uh, calendar on your <laughs> computer and September get the Saturday. 5th, September 5th. 93 yeah. so I would have been 12. I would have been 12 when I saw that show. Right? That was Pretty cool. Then you, could, then you can get the uh see if someone left the set. Yeah, Eat the Rich they opened up with Toys in the Attic Love and Elevator. Yeah. You know, and you could click the button i was there <laughs> that's so incredible it's just that's cool awesome. that that exists yeah. right yeah i gotta go i gotta go and dig through that because there's a bunch of shows i'd like to see like what dates those were so i can again being able to like anchor your experiences to something solid um i'm 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 a pop culture like glutton like i love movies and tv and stuff like that and i it's funny i listen to a podcast that its whole reason to exist is um, what was going on that week, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and 10 years ago. Uh, it's called 30, 20, 10. And they literally say, here's what was on TV, like back in right now, it's uh, 1991 for this week, specifically this week, and it's a weekly mm-hmm. show. And so like, I'll listen to it. Oh, okay, that's cool. But I, they'll hit on something where it's like, oh my God, a rush of memories will come back because yeah, it's right. anchored to this thing that I remember tangentially, but to be mm-hmm. how they'll have a cemented anchor. And I think like, that's what, music and other pop culture does for us. It like mm-hmm. helps us anchor our experiences in something that is shared and can be solidly looked at. It's like a signpost, right? It's like, like you said, you're, you're on the website, you're on, I was here, right? We have this like cultural signpost where you're like, no, we were here at this point and this is when this thing happened. Because unfortunately the, the record keeper up here is, as the years mm-hmm. go on, becomes less and less uh, on the job, let's just say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah man I, I have a lot to say about that i, I want to just get some comments here yeah. so melissa mara says her favorite live music is every time she sees her students killing it uh and so i can only imagine is, yeah yeah and i <laughs> say that is an amazing feeling i've kind of i've had a bit of that experience in my day and melissa mara says i took my son to see imagine dragons two summers Ooh. ago and he was that's gotta be 12. great show 
he was 12 at the time and he literally cried and moved him to tears of joy that's amazing mm -hmm. like that's and that's something that's something he will never forget like i am 40 and i still remember what it was like to be at that show that is something your son will never forget that's incredible yeah right yeah uh, and so speaking of timelines um so one thing so i'm trying to i, I don't know if i've gotten into the <laughs> weaves with you about how I'm writing my book. So I'm writing an autobiography for everyone who's listening who may not know. And uh, I'm basically what I was, one of my focuses is to tell a story where I try to treat the John of each year with equal importance. Mm. It's hard to do because the tendency is of course, like as you're older, you write a lot more about your formative or your, your right. adult, early adult years. And then your successes or whatever that is, uh, you know, Get, we get. we tend to create a narrative about our, our lives. Like we are we are a being of we are storytelling beings. We try to right. create narratives out of everything, and so it's that's the problem with our memories. We tend to truncate and combine stuff for like narrative purposes right. without even realizing it a lot of times. And that's a tough thing, man. Doing what you're trying to do, where you're like, all right, each year is the year, can be a really tough thing to track down. It's it's incredibly elusive and, and but a fun puzzle because I found a lot of tools and ways to do it and, and definitely only possible because of the uh, internet world that we live in. You know, uh, it would have to be a much different story, more narrative based story mm. if I was doing it purely from my memory. But I'm doing a lot of research, a lot of timeline stuff, and uh, so I, basically my idea is like for each year of my life, up to forty years, I'm going to do two thousand words per chapter per year. Wow. And that's, that's just a goal because I don't want, wow. I don't want year one to be uh, 50 words. You know, I want it to be, right. uh, to really, because, so the, the title of my book right now, um, the subtitle, uh, actually I could tell you, I could, I could do the big reveal, the title that I feel comfortable about now. So I was going, my working title was John Henry Sheridan, uh, A Life in Context, uh, 1980, 2020. Yeah. And I'm that, excited. The big reveal is happening right now, man. I'm yeah, sure. it's, this is great. It's great. <laughs> so um, yeah, I want to kind of pull it up as a, as a screen share, but um, I, I'll just, just say it. So the, the title, I'm taking a class on writing actually, and they helped me understand, really dig deep as to what what's the purpose of picking a good title and what's the essence of my book. I'm just telling a little background of it to yeah. see the, the journey here. So I uh, recently have been reading Thomas Merton's uh, biography, not autobiography, and he's a Christian uh, Catholic Trappist monk who's a writer and he's a contemplative. Again, there and, was if if you guys out there haven't listened to the previous episode with Constantine, you guys talk about that a bunch. It was fascinating. Uh, you guys were talking about like his story and how he went from the Catholic Church to like becoming like Buddhist and bridging the gap between East and West there. Um, really interesting stuff that got me interested in um, like looking more into the topic. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for that shout out. Yeah. So there are, you can find on my Facebook page, you can find the uh, previous episodes there if you scroll down, but also on YouTube, music philosophy and more, you can visit a playlist of all the episodes and Constantine Mediac was episode 12. Mike Mari's episode 13. Lucky. 13. Um, yes, of course. Uh, so, um, I realized that, so struggling with my story was, I always wanted to tell my story. And it was since I was a kid, but I, I thought it was going to be like a success story for years and years. So then I, but as I'm writing, I'm like, it's not a rock star dream. It's not an American dream story. So with, with, uh, but I still kept writing it, but, uh, with reading Thomas Merton, I realized about him, actually, uh, I realized that his autobiography is what's called a spiritual biography, spiritual autobiography. And I realized that that's what mine is. And what that means, it just has a particular arc. It's born into the world from this sort of purity, pure being. And then you go into this um, existentialist thing from some, some disruption, existentialism, dark night of the soul and pursuing things and fruitlessly and then realizing the path is in his case, it wasn't such a middle path. It was a, a bit extreme, but then he found the middle path was more natural. And for me, I got out of this rock star dream pursuit and went into serving more uh, through teaching, through serving with my music and, and becoming Buddhist. 
So, mm. uh, so my story is a sp- what's called a spiritual bi- autobiography or spiritual biography. So now that I know that there's a, uh, a template, it just feels a lot better. So like I didn't have, I was tempted to put the word music in my, in my right. uh, autobiography because it's what people associate with me, but I don't think it's really the crux of what it moves me the most in my life. So the title is Truth Seeker and the uh, sub- subtitle is A Creative Life in Context, 1980. Nice. 2020. I Truth like that. Seeker. Thanks. And, and it, so I want to I w- I push you on a question here, actually. I'm going to interview you for a second. So you said that you initially were looking at it as like, well, this is going to be like a success story like book. I got to ask you a question. How is this still not a success for you? Like, how do we define success is something I'm fascinated by, like, mm-hmm. as I'm getting older. Like, where do you think, where, where, how do you define success? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for calling me on it. Uh, so the, what I meant by that is, uh, like, I'm talking about eighth grade. I was asked to write an autobiography and mm. I wrote it. And I guess I planted those seeds and I started doing keeping journals from eighth grade. And I had this idea that one day I'm going to be famous and everyone's going to love my music and just want to know all about me. So I'm going to mm. keep a record of my life so that there'll be plenty for them to draw upon, you know, and successful at that time, you know, dictated from the society I grew up in meant right. I would have a lot of money and I'll be famous. That's basically what I thought, you know? Right. And uh, as most of us grew up thinking like that was like the thing all of us were chasing, right? Like <laughs> we were thinking like, oh, that's what we want to be. Right. And as I, Probably even in my teens, I was realizing that that's probably not really going to make me happy, but I guess I'm going to try to do it anyway, you know, but, and so I kept trying to do it until it really proved to be dangerous, put it that way, you know, right. I yeah. could see that I prefer to live than to die. And I prefer to live uh, contributing to a healthier world than to destroy the planet. You know, it's kind of right. got to that point. So, um, so I do definitely regard my story as a success story as far as uh, um, it, but tearing, tearing apart any old paradigm concept of success, you know, success in that I've, I've written the story of my life and lived the story that I wrote. I co-created my life. It didn't let, like you're saying, it didn't just let life happen to me. Right. I co-created it with the universe. And, uh, and I really learned how to say no when I need to say no, how to say yes to what I want to say yes to. And I allowed myself to evolve as compassionate with myself in the process. I experienced a bunch of crazy things, a bunch of wonderful things, interesting things. Here's it all. Here it all is. Hopefully you can see how your life is similar. You know, this is kind of like the, the idea. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to entertain you, uh, but I'm going to also uh, <coughs> remind you of how powerful one human life can be. And hopefully in the, in the, the, the contextual part uh, is that I'm digging in to the timeline of each year so that people can, when, when I write about first in playing Super Mario 3, when you read that, you're going to get a whole bunch of things about your life, you know, when you, yeah. so that, that's why I'm doing Just it. you saying that literally, like it ding something <laughs> in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking about it like that. So it's a service in the sense that maybe not, people don't have the time to write their story, but when they read mine, they could say, oh, shoot, I remember that. I remember that. And then gives people a window to, to reflect on their life you know because i was gonna say from from where i'm sitting down if i may if i might be so bold to say looking at what you've been able to build for yourself i would by any measure be able to say that it's been you know it's success even if we are able to cut it down to the basics of you know music has always been your passion and that is still what you're doing you know that's what that's the gift you're still sharing with the world that's how you're spending your days you know music is still the integral part of what you're doing in your life. And yes, it's not the filling an arena rock star success, but it is still your life. And it is still something that is like the integral side of how you're living your life. And I think that more than anything, like you, we can look to someone like you and say, no, that's someone who is successful. Someone who's been able to build so much from this passion that he has. And so that's why when you said like, oh, it was a success story, but then I had to change. I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know so much if I uh, agree with it not being successful. Yeah, no, thank you. Th- I definitely appreciate that. And, and he- hearing from you, it helps a lot because you know my journey quite a bit. And yeah, I appreciate that. So I guess what I had to wrestle with was that this book will go out there. Of course, I would like 
some people to buy it, right? <clears throat> of course, yes. on some level, I, I, really, I feel that I have to write this book, whether, whether just one person reads it or not, because right. I don't want to write a book that conforms to anyone's expectations, but I got to write the book that's in me. But at the same time, if I can do it in such a way that would be attractive for people who even know nothing about me to read, then I'd rather do that too. Might 100%. As well be, you know, Absolutely. As great as possible. There, there's nothing wrong with trying to reach as many people as possible. And there's nothing wrong with trying to, you know, get it out there for as many eyeballs to see, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And that's, that's great. And you're approaching it from the right mindset. You're approaching it from, I'm doing it solely because it needs to be done because it's what I passionately feel needs to be done. And whether it reaches one or 1 million people, it's okay. It's done its job. And I, mm-hmm. I think that's, that's, that's a great way of looking at that. Cause otherwise you drive yourself crazy, you know? Like you said, like you would listen to podcasts, like, why am I not reaching this level or that level? You know, no, it's okay. You're doing your thing and you're, you're making the thing that you are making. And that is your success there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and part of the struggle, I totally agree. And and actually Melissa Melissa Mara says she, she agrees, Mike, well said from what you've been saying. And she also mentioned that it's a, it's a process. It's a journey. Um, I guess I had to figure like, who, who's buying autobiographies and you know it's, it's more than I can process but thinking in terms of like getting this book out there what would someone search be, who doesn't know me who I'm not like particularly emailing and mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I don't my reach is not too expansive you know what would someone search that they can encounter my book and be interested with knowing nothing about this kind of random person that's so I had to take music out of it because I don't mm-hmm. think that's the core of, of what because I, I want grandmothers to read it and I want uh, 12 year olds to be able to read it, you know, and to, to find that core of humanity. So the creative part, uh, that is really, my life has been creative. Now I'm a writer more than a musician in a sense, but the creative part is real. And- right, and I, and I think the Truth Seeker title also works really well with just getting the feel of what you're going for. Because again, it's, it's an individual's journey trying to find like their truth in the world, right? Like trying to figure out like, what this kind of all means for them. And I think that is a, a much better title uh, that will kind of better let a prospective reader know what they're in for. I, I really like that. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate it. And, and that really, I feel that's what my life has been, you know, because I would seek a try. And then, no, not this. Try. No, not this. Try. No, not this. But And everywhere I tried, I would also feel what is what is true about me or what, what, is, what is meaningful to me but there were so many paths that were not for me i would say most you know yeah. and and i had to find my my own narrow path which is very specific to to my personality and, but it was through trying trial and error like seeking the truth so people say this is good let me see is that true not for me a little bit you know is it is it true if i you know so i had to just try right. things and find how how much of it the truth was there and that includes listening to potentially toxic music that includes my whole thing in years of horror movies and you know then going the other direction being more uh sort of clean clean minded about things with the prayerful life and stuff you know and actually Melissa Mars said and that was a major part of how you chose to explore your guitar learning yeah yeah I'd say so I didn't look at it in any one one which way i remember i had a classical guitar teacher in college who was a really great teacher who said john you know you have a future being a classical guitar player so i really brought all my enthusiasm and my skill to those lessons and i was honored he was a great player and but uh as i explored my soul i was like no way not for me like because there was just the power that i the reason I fell in love with music was the power of heavy metal and rock. And like, to there's just no way I can get anywhere near that with just one guitar or even a group of guitars. I, I love it. It's a part of me, but my truth was not that, you know? Again, it's that moment of, if this is what I'm going to do day in and day out, I'm not going to be fulfilled. You know, mm-hmm. that unfortunately not everyone comes to that realization, right? Not everyone. Everyone's like, okay, this is a path that's been laid before me. I'm going to take it. Um, you had the forethought to be like, no, this, I can take this path. I can do very well on this path, but it's not what's going to fulfill like my soul, like deep within me. And that, that takes a lot of 
of courage. Like it's, it's a lot of like being able to say, no, here's something that's laid out for me that I can do well with, but I'm not going to take it because, well, there's something else out there for me. Mm-hmm. And that's a repeated pattern in my life. Mm-hmm. Teaching. I, I actually don't love teaching, believe it or not. I don't, uh, I do love it only when I have a passionate student. And when I, right. Don't, Unfortunately, you don't always get that passionate student. <laughs> no, it's very rare, as you know. Uh, <laughs> and I, I don't love it teaching for teaching's sake. You know, I'm a creator first, right. teacher second, not, not the other way around. So I have to create before I teach or, or more, it's more primary to, to my soul and my spirit being at peace is to create. That, that's why I relate right. so much to Thomas Merton. He, had, he was a writer before he was a Catholic, if you could imagine mm. that. Yeah. It was, that was more fundamental to him. So, that was more core to his being than yeah. his religion, yeah. Which and he was a he was a monk, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> for him to say that that writing was that much more important than religion is really saying something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and what most of Mars just uh, said that. Listen to you guys, you're extraordinary. This conversation has fulfilled my evening and so much more. Love you both. I'm Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. We love you too, and. We're looking forward. Uh, I'm looking forward to having her on, on the podcast too, Mike. I, I invited her, and we're going to make that happen. Oh, I am looking summer. forward to that episode. Mm-hmm. This is great. <laughs> I'm getting all these like the things mentioned on this on, the, on this podcast. This is great. <laughs> yeah, this it's, it's really fun. Um, yeah, so so thanks for the feedback on on the, the book and um, so know, yeah. if you uh, if you have any inspiring books, films, or shows that you would like to recommend to our list? Let's say three. Um, um, that, that would be uplifting. Let's say people having a tough time and kind of struggling with whatever the, the lockdown or post-lockdown, whatever we are in now. Something that would be inspiring to people. So, books, movies. So books, uh, book, film, TV show. I, I think I can do one of each, actually, if we're doing three here. Um, so I'm going to look up. I'm, I'm looking down at my phone because I want to get the author's name right. Um, there's a great book out there. Uh, of course, now that's not coming up because my internet's not. Here we go. There's a book out there that I read a couple of years back. That is a phenomenal book. It's called Some, Some S-U-M, 40 Tales from the Afterlives, plural. Uh, it's by a guy named David Eagleman. He is actually a neurologist. Uh, I believe he's a neurologist. Yes, he's a neuroscientist. Uh, so he's someone who you wouldn't initially think would be a great author to read. But he writes basically these 40 kind of micro short stories looking at what possible afterlives could be if we strip away like dogmatic religion and things like that. We take away tradition. We take a look at, okay, what are our like humane hopes and dreams for what an afterlife could be? And one of them, and some of them look very familiar as to what like a heaven might be if you were raised in a certain like religion. And so they're they're very non-theistic but uh, there's one in particular uh, to give you an example of the types of stories that are in here where he imagines an afterlife where basically you walk into a giant room and it's like Grand Central Station. Uh, Imagine Grand Central Station, but you look up and the roof is just the galaxy and lining the walls of Grand Central Station are just a thousand doors. Uh, As far as the eye can see doors everywhere and people are milling about. Some people are sitting and waiting. Some people see a number pop up and then they walk through their door and they leave. Um, and so your viewpoint character in the story sits down and talks to someone and says, what's happening here? They go, oh, this is, you know, kind of like what purgatory is, right? The, the waiting place. Except and instead of being placed for penance, it's explained to him that this is the place where you wait to be forgotten. That mm-hmm. as long as you're remembered, you are still in this in-between place. And it's a good thing because you can still peek in and check in and see what people are saying about you and seeing what your impact you had on people's lives. But at some point, you will be forgotten. And then you can go on to something new. You can go on to something better. Who's to say what it is past this? But as long as you are remembered by a single person, you are still tethered to this planet in some way. And so they have this big philosophical conversation about that. And a lot of the book is these philosophical conversations about what can we imagine the afterlife to be if we completely untether it from constraints? And he comes up with 40 different ones of these. And it's a great little book. It really, I remember I read it years ago. I fell in love with the book 
uh, listen to it on audiobook. There's a great audiobook version of it also out there if you're a person who loves audiobooks. Um, so yeah, some uh, 40 Tales from the Afterlives. And what's if his we're name talking, again? What's his, uh, what's his, his name, name is David Eagleman. Mm -hmm. Like eagle, like the bird with man at the end. Now I got yeah. an image of a guy with eagle wings and that's just awesome. Um, so that's a great book. That's very uplifting, inspirational. Uh, as far as a show, it's something that a lot of people probably have watched because it is pretty popular. But if you haven't had a chance to watch The Good Place, I adore The Good Place. It is, for those who don't know, a show that steeps itself in philosophy. I have to give my hat off, tip my hat off to The Good Place for taking things like teaching parts of Manuel Kant's views as part of like their comedic sitcom. Uh, and it's about a person who finds himself in the afterlife in the good place. Uh, the twist in the first episode, the not spoiling anything, is that she doesn't belong there. She was not a good person. She's been mixed up with somebody else. And she now has to learn how to be a good person. And a lot of that is philosophically driven. And so she, there's a main character named Chidi, who I love in that show. He was a philosophy professor. And so he was a morals professor. And so it's about him trying to teach her to be a better person. And then it blows out from there. Like it's such a great show that touches on what it means to be human, what it means to be good, like truly in your soul good and how our definitions of good are so lacking in a lot of ways. And how, again, if we unchain it from traditional ideas of what one religion or the other would say, and instead of looking at it as like a continuity or a continuum of things. Uh, and it's a funny show too. Like it's really, really well written and it's got some really funny gags in it. But at its heart, it is trying to tell a very humane story um, that if you want something uplifting, definitely watch that. You will cry multiple times throughout the multiple seasons of that. Uh, I'm a weepy person. I cry at stuff anyway when it gets too emotional. This show will hit you hard. Uh, so The Good Place is a good one to watch if you're looking for something uplifting. and a bit Where, where can I find that? Uh, uh, currently, currently. It uh, might be on Netflix, might be on Hulu. I watched it on Hulu, uh, but they might have moved over to Netflix. It's one of those two. Um, Check on Netflix, see if it's there. If it's not, it's probably on Hulu. Uh, it just, and uh, right before COVID happened, so end of 2019, the show ended. So you have a complete show. It's five seasons, I think. Uh, great mm -hmm. show to watch. Uh, and again, fits into anyone who's interested in what you've been talking about as far as philosophical things. Right up their alley. Really good stuff. Um, there's an amazing gag with the trolley problem where they make the trolley problem a real thing. Like they're living through the trolley. It's hilarious. Um, anyhow. Uh, and as far as a movie, uh, this is going to be a standard go-to. A lot of, no one's going to be surprised that I mentioned this. If you want something, again, that's going to speak to the, the humanity in everybody, my favorite movie of all time also happens to be a Stephen King story, uh, The Shawshank Redemption. Uh, the Shawshank Redemption remains, every year I watch it just to make sure I still like it. And I love it even more every single year. Uh, it is just about the, how humanity, even in the worst situations, can shine through and persevere. And again, the idea of living your life purposefully, like instead of just kind of accepting the situation you're in, even when it is a situation that seems completely crushing and undeniably certain, you still have to have that fight in you. You still have to have that drive to live the life you want to live. So Shawshank Redemption, just a phenomenal movie. Uh, but if you're looking at it for like just something to kind of feed your soul with something positive, really good movie. There's some dark stuff in there. I'm not going to lie. It's a movie about prison. Uh, but by the end of it, you, you should feel amazing by the end of that movie. If you don't, I don't know who you are. Um, so those are the three things I would suggest if you're looking for things to uplift you a bit. Cool. That very, very uh, clear explanation of each one and why you recommend it. And um I, the Shawshank Redemption, I think I'll wait on uh, just because of the amount of hours and stuff. I imagine it's long, and, and I watch everything with Kai pretty much. Yeah, I'm it's like it's long. like a two and a half hour long movie. It's yeah, yeah so, it's, it's it's a bit of a commitment. Yeah, and I'm just not watching dark stuff these days. Yeah, yeah no, because having the time roll, but I, I didn't know it was that good, so I'll definitely factor that in. Uh, the Good Place sounds really interesting. Um, yeah, I think you would get a really kick out. I think the audience would really enjoy the, the good place. It's it's such a well-written show and such just conceptually. It's just, ah, sorry, I can't say enough nice things about it. And, and it's so nice that they did get to complete it. You know, like you said, a complete Yeah, story. it is a complete story. Like they they ended it on their terms. Like they wanted, it's funny that Michael Shore, the, he's one of the guys who made The Office, made The Good Place. They actually did want him, I think, to go another season or two. And he said, no, like we're ending it on our terms because we want the story to end in this particular way. 
and it works mm -hmm. very well in that way. Nice. And then uh, some Ford, some the Ford details from the Afterlife. It sounds definitely sounds like something you would like, you know. And yeah, uh, and it, I can yeah, see it, it almost like Ray Bradbury, uh, Twilight Zone. You know what it reminded me of? King. You know what it reminded me of? Actually, I'm going to sneak a secret fourth one in here on you guys. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Matheson, if you've ever heard the name. Uh, he is basically Stephen King before Stephen King. He wrote like half of the Twilight Zone episodes. Do you remember? Yes, he wrote yes. the episode with uh, the dude breaking his glasses. He's the one who wrote the episode with the thing on the wing, the terror at 10,000 feet. Um, he wrote a book called What Dreams May, May Come, which was made into a Robin Williams movie about the afterlife. Some reminds me a lot of that book. What Dreams May Come is very different from the movie that was made. I do like the movie. A lot of people don't. What Dreams May Come is him basically, and if you read it, read the introduction. Don't skip the introduction. Richard Matheson basically says, this book is fiction insofar as these aren't real people. But the things I'm talking about, I truly believe in my heart to be true. And so what he did is he spent years studying different people's accounts of what they believe the afterlife to be and what their experiences with near-death experiences were. And he combined them into this book, What Dreams May Come. He basically said, I found all of these things across all these different cultures and religions that were the same. I found the things that were the same. So how can, how can these not be truisms? And so he explores mm -hmm. it through a fictional story that just, again, heart-wrenching at points, gets a little dark sometimes, but just it, it hits you on so many different levels. And it explores a lot of the ideas of, well, what would heaven be? Like people think, oh, heaven is this place where you get all these things you want. And well, no, it's the thing, it's a place where you don't care anymore about those things is like one of the ways they explain it is like you have to change your entire thinking of being once you transcend into an afterlife. And so what dreams may come is also a good read. If you're looking for something to explore different thoughts of what the afterlife might be um, similar to some 40 tales from the afterlives. Uh, that's cool. I, I had no idea that what dreams may come was it's, it's, it's seeing so many things converging because for me, uh, huge fan of twilight zone it's one of the only shows i truly oh, great love show. Great and show. i've watched I, seasonally so for uh for the whole you know they used to have the marathon on uh, new year's eve right new and, year's eve yeah, yeah yeah and so they still do i think and then um july 4th they said the marathon i when i was a kid i don't know if you remember that and yeah uh, channel 11 it was wpix we used to do it every year they yeah. would do that and they would do the honeymooners on new year's eve Right. Yeah. And but do you remember the July 4th marathon of the uh, Twilight Zone? Yeah. Yeah. That okay, was yeah. that was how as a kid I started watching it. Like that was uh, the only the time I was really right. watching it. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't I didn't have the time to marathon anything anymore. Right. You know, I can't do <laughs> more than two or three episodes, you know, if I'm lucky. So yeah. I would do the whole two two weeks before I would start every day watching a few episodes with Kai now. And uh he likes it. And so you know. I'm really immersed. I have Twilight's own book about each how, how it was made. Anyway, so oh, I know nice. Richard Matheson. I, I, I definitely, knowing how much I love the stories, I don't know which stories he wrote, which he didn't, but I know I see the name so many times. Yeah. Well, because he wrote a lot of short stories and Rod Serling would adapt them. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I, I kind of knew a little about that much about him. Yeah. But um, what dreams may come, speaking of inspirational movies and books, what Dreams May Come was directed or produced, I'm not sure, by a guy named Stephen Simon. Have you okay. Heard him? Yeah. So Stephen Simon is, uh, was one of the co-founders of what's called the Spiritual Cinema Circle. So this was a, huh. a, a, a community that was a, a company that was putting out spiritual uh, shorts and, and feature length, including interviews occasionally and documentaries yeah. from like 2007 or so until... 2019 or 2020 they closed and uh so we would subscribe to them my family for years so we had a whole huge collection of these with wow. so many inspirational uh spiritual spiritually driven move and that doesn't mean they're always like uh right feel good or anything like that like well, you know like, you said shawshank yeah. redemption would be yeah. almost or like even what dreams may come deals with some very dark things like as a movie right. that is an uplifting movie it goes to some very seriously dark places in there um, so, you know, something being spiritually uplifting doesn't necessarily mean it's, you know, people have a, a preconceived notion about what you mean when you say something like that. Right. Like right. corny or something, but yeah. definitely not. Um, yeah. So anyway, Stephen Simon uh, was, you know, the, the spiritual cinema circle. So it's funny how that all yeah. just ties in. Um, 
Yeah, and anyway, that closed shop, but uh, so, so many great movies there. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess it's getting kind of late. I imagine you probably have to work tomorrow. Yeah, I got to be up uh, about five in the morning, so. <laughs> uh, I should respect your time. Oh no! I listen. I appreciate it. this. Was this was this was enjoyable? I, I I love doing stuff like this. So, anytime you know, let me know. I'd be more than happy to do this again. Yeah, I definitely would like to have you back on uh, once, twice, twenty times. Who knows? And um, and and we will talk about uh, doing another collaboration in the not too distant future. I'm sure. Absolutely, I'm very much looking forward to the chance to work with you again uh, to make another creative thing. Like that's that's. I love working with creative people. I love working with people who are passionate about what they do because that helps drive me to make like the best thing I can make. So absolutely looking forward to collaborate again. Yeah. So I'll put a link to the, the daddy video there. So daddy was a, a, the song we briefly talked about. And it, it's a, I think a really wonderful video that uh, Mike Thank took, you. took the helm on. And uh, I, one of the great pleasures of working with you on it was that you were, um, you not only love the song, which was so important to that that you would approach me rather than me having to like right. can convince someone or, or explain to someone the spirit you you already totally knew it, and then you kind of had to convince you didn't have to convince but you explained to me the vision like what the vision was yeah yeah and I was like oh wow so you have a vision and it's, it's it was very helpful for me to hear it from someone who's not me because it was very hard for me to understand how anyone else would experience that song, you know? Right. And it, you, having someone else's point of view helps you understand, Oh, this is, even if it's not necessarily how you would have envisioned it, you're like, okay, but I can see where someone else would come from with this. Like why would they would envision it this way? Yeah. And, and why, it, why that could work uh, better than, than something I could think of. Right. Because, because you are already from the listener's point of view, you know, Right. And uh, yeah. So anyway, working with you was a pleasure for that reason. And just hanging out with you was always fun. And, but then your work ethic and your <laughs> talent with the video was like, thank you. Moly, this guy turned something around fast. And thank I'm not you. expecting I... that you have to do it in the future if we work together, but no, I was I impressed by that, you know? Well, and, and again, it's something where I had a lot of drive to do it. And it's one of those things, like you said, you know, as we are people with a lot of, you know, things in our lives that we're responsible for, I want to make sure I'm giving, the proper amount of time and attention to all the things I need to give to them. And so I wanted to make sure that I was giving the proper amount of time. I dedicated, I said to you, I was going to do this and we're going to do this. I want to make sure that I was respecting like your time with that as well. I didn't want it to be like, oh, okay, we shot the, the video and uh, we'll, 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 it's going to take like, I'm like, no, I have the vision for this. I'm going to start working on it and it'll get worked on until it's done. Um, and because yes, again, I felt very passionately about it. And yeah, working with you was great. Like it was, again, any excuse to be able to do something creative with, you know, with friends is always a great thing. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I, had a, I had a blast doing it. Cool. Yeah, so looking forward to the next one. And if, whether it's in person or we do it somehow by sending each other digital files or a mix of both, you know, I'm, I'm getting either way. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to have a conversation about that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, All right well, man. thank you for so, having yeah. me on, John. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. I'll get the uh, other video. I'll get this up on YouTube soon with the links and everything. And um, yeah, have a wonderful night. And thank, uh, thank your wife for me for uh, lending uh, you to us. We'll do. She is a very understanding woman. I will give her that. She is very understanding. And um, I, honestly, if I can leave with one thing I do want to say, I always have to thank her for just being super supportive of all the nonsense I get in my head that I want to do. Um, like, when I, I want to go and spend an entire day, you know, hanging out with you to go shoot a video, of course she has no issue with it. And it's no problem. And I, I do everything I can to make sure I have respect in her time and making sure it, it works for our schedule together as a couple. But she has been very patient with all the things I've wanted to do and all the, like these crazy ideas I've been able to kind of like chase after because mm -hmm. she's been as supportive as she has been. So I have to say that it's, I cannot do what I do with my life right now if it wasn't for having uh, a wife and a partner just as just supportive as, as she as she is and i'm i recognize not as many people have that as should you know and that is something i feel very lucky to have yeah i could sense that there's that support and uh teamwork there it's definitely uh, i could sense it especially because how you're your jolly self you know <laughs> so it must mean that there's a good chemistry going on with the partnership so I'm glad to hear that. And yeah, once again, thank you. Thank you. To, uh, your family. 
and for your for your boys for uh maybe taking a shower early tonight or something so they can <laughs> see I did have to wrestle one of them into the bed a little earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but anytime, John. Thank you so much. All right, man. Have a great night and uh, you talk too. to you soon. Take care.